the uh, technical committee of CASA. Uh, all of you who are now uh, have been involved in this process for a while know that it is an iterative process and we are continuing to focus on uh, solving every housing problem there exists in the Bay Area. So we're kind of got high goals. Um, I think it's appropriate, and, and at least uh, myself and Fred want to uh, take a special note of the sad occurrence that happened yesterday, as you all know. Uh, our mayor of San Francisco and a uh, regional leader and a member of our steering committee, Mayor Ed Lee, passed away shockingly in the night. And uh, for those of us who knew him both professionally and or personally, uh, you knew that he was not your typical politician. He did not want the job, starting with that. Uh, he's not glib and uh, he's not glamorous, but he was passionate and was uh, you know, here to serve everyone in San Francisco. He understood the economy. When he took over the job, uh, we were 10 or 12% unemployment. He knew that the city could not function if it didn't create jobs. So he put a lot of effort into that. The uh, tax measures that were done. Uh, and then, as we all know, there are unintended consequences of amazing success. So rents started rising and buildings were being built and, and homelessness became uh, a watchword for everyday life. It spread to other cities as well, but this was sort of the, the centerpiece of those struggles. So uh, he was a, a rare, uh, rare find, and uh, we were blessed to have him, and we will uh, now try to find someone who can keep that mission going. Uh, maybe Fred, you want to say a little bit? Um, yeah, I would just uh, add that uh, yesterday, uh, for me, was a tough day to get through, actually. And I know that there are a bunch of people around this table who probably uh, experienced yesterday uh, in the exact same way uh, that I did. You know, um, a lot of folks, and, you know, a lot has been written and uh, said uh, in the media about uh, what the loss of a mayor means. And, uh, the mayor's commitment to public service and the uh, many things that he was able to accomplish from a variety of positions uh, in the city. But for me, uh, what I will uh, miss most is his honesty, um, his commitment to uh, the work uh, and to public service, and his uh, humility, uh, the ability uh, to do the work in a way that is uh, uh, courageous uh, and thoughtful uh, and without uh, ego. And I will uh, miss it a lot. It's hard to do that. And Mike, I just want to add on behalf of Steve and the team, um, the Mayor Lee was known as a, a big leader of this, of this city, but what is less known is that he was really a regionalist. And his involvement in the commission with his counterparts uh, Mayor Licardo and Mayor Schaaf, in many ways transformed the commission. They formed a partnership that created an urban agenda at the commission that never really existed before, and a housing and transportation together approach that was new. Um, he was a big supporter of the staff integration. Um, they were big supporters of turning our regional plan into something that had action, which led to the convening of CASA. And I was struck by, in October, when Steve and Alex and I met with him, um, how enthusiastic he was about this process. He said that he thought this was the right mix of people, uh, that the timing was right, that he thought that this could really make a difference. And as always, I was struck by, as a staffer, in my interactions with him, with just what a decent guy he was. He never had an air of pretension. He never looked down his nose at anyone. But also that he was really focused on the middle class, low-income people, the people who really make this city work, and really trying to address the tremendous changes that had happened in recent years. And I thought, given what he had been through in recent years, that he could be that optimistic and that poignant and really feel like this process could work, that maybe it could. Um, and so we will, we will miss him greatly. Uh, he has big shoes to fill here on the commission, and his role uh, here was significant. Thanks. So why don't we just give a little moment of silence in memory of Mayor Edgley. Okay. 
Thank you. And if, uh, if you really need to get a sense of the Chronicle today has a really good uh, uh, edition on all of his friends and fellows and their comments about him as well. So worth the read. So, um, so I'm Mike Rubius, one of your co-chairs. You know Fred and you know Leslie. And uh, since Fred and I weren't here for the last meeting, Leslie ran it and she recommended that, that as opposed to the other two of us butting in all the time, it'd be better if one of us runs the meeting. We'll alternate, so I'm going to run today's meeting. Uh, but if you have a complaint, come to Fred. Uh, so um, we have a couple of new members I want to introduce. And, and we thought we'd save some time and rather than doing the round of table introductions, because I think a lot of you are working together. If at some point you're speaking and you want to make a point, then maybe just say what your organization is at that point in time. <clears throat> but we have two new members, um, Amy Inglis, which I'm not sure that you saw. No, they both are unable to attend. Oh, there you are. Okay, so, um, so, so, okay, we're over two. But Amy uh, <laughs> is uh, the uh, director of an organization called Tenants Together. So she'll be a good addition. And then uh, Michelle Bird is replacing Claudia Capio from the city of Oakland. She's the director of housing and community development. And they already have one minus check. For that video. <laughs> so uh, so we'll, we'll try to get them engaged as we go further. Well, we'll give Michelle a bonus point because she already came to one of the committee meetings. Oh, excellent. That gets two bonus points. Uh, okay, so today we're going to give you an update on all the things that are going on in Washington uh, and California a little bit, but they're not, a, they're not done. But Georgia, I saw earlier. There we are. Georgia's going to give us the update from the MTC. Uh, Hi, Georgia Ann Jordan, an MTC and ABAG staff. Um, as I'm sure all of you are well aware, Congress has been debating a $1.5 trillion tax overhaul over the past month and a half. Um, the House and Senate passed their respective bills, uh, finalized those last week, and a conference committee has been meeting over the past week to resolve the differences between the two bills. Um, earlier this morning, reports uh, came out that a compromise has been reached, um, or an agreement in principle, and details of what that agreement uh, looks like have started to leak out. So we don't have text yet, but what we do know is that there are some potentially really big impacts for housing in the state of California, um, depending on what the final versions of the bill version of the bill looks like. The first piece that I know many of you have been very engaged on is the uh, that the House bill would have effectively eliminated the uh, one of California's most important affordable housing financing tools, the four percent low income housing tax credit. Um, the estimates from the California Housing Partnership are that that would result in a loss of about 20,000 affordable units in California per year. The Senate version would have retained that, um, the, retained the tax credit program in whole. And um, again, there's been a huge organizing effort led by a lot of people around this table to retain that credit. And uh, although we have not seen text yet, um, Matt might be able to provide a, a more detailed update after I'm done on um, something that he's heard recently. On uh, another similar financing issue is the issue of advanced refunding. Both bills would eliminate uh, the ability of state and local governments to essentially refinance their debt and realize savings from lower interest rates. Um, this has been a pretty important tool uh, across the, the nation and particularly in California for states and local governments to um, realize debt service savings. Those savings are generally uh, able to be, uh, so basically the, the impact of that is that it would impact state and local budgets and their ability to direct any of those savings into new infrastructure investments like transportation or housing infrastructure. The next update is on the home ownership incentive side. Uh, many of the um, provisions in both the House and the Senate bill uh, that touch home ownership incentives would disproportionately impact high cost, high income regions like the Bay Area. We are hearing reports that the final bill, or I'm seeing reports that the final bill would bring down the mortgage interest deduction cap to 750,000 from 1 million. Um, and then another big issue that has been up for debate in uh, difference between the House and the Senate bills have been around taxpayers' abilities to deduct their state and local uh, taxes from their federal tax liability. 
And what, again, we're seeing reports on that says that there's going to be a new cap on state and local tax deductions, and taxpayers will be able to choose to either deduct up to $10,000 of their property taxes or their income taxes from their federal tax liability. And again, the, the biggest impact um, of both that mortgage interest deduction and the state and local tax piece will be on areas in areas like the Bay Area with really high housing costs and high incomes. So, Matt, do you want to provide a little bit of an update? Sure, I can just elaborate a little bit. And I just want to caution all of us, including myself, that until um, we see the bill in print, which is likely Friday, we cannot, we should not be counting any chickens or, or any vegetables of any kind. Um, but as uh, Georgia reported, the uh, current agreement is private activity bonds will continue. Uh, and of course, access to 4% percent low income housing tax credits will also continue. But there was a, um, there, there is a cloud on that horizon. Chairman Kevin Brady of uh, Ways and Means Committee did exact what he considers a promise to that he will be able to come back sometime soon and try to narrow access to private activity bonds in unspecified ways. So that fight is not over. It will uh, have to be revisited. Um, on two other smaller uh, issues, the, um, there was, I don't know how many of you tracked this, but there was talk of limiting how high cost areas and high poverty areas can be a basis boost for low income housing tax credits. That talk of a cap has been dropped, is out. Um, on a sad note for artist housing, which I know is a big deal. In San Francisco, Oakland, and probably other places. Um, as a reflection of so called values, they have replaced the preference that allows uh, housing to serve tar target artists to uh, be only for veterans. We have been hoping they would add veterans to additional artists, but instead they replaced the artists with veterans. And um, the other, the, the missing piece here. Uh, besides playing good defense, is we were not able to get a uh, adjustments to re-increase the value of credit back up to where it was before the election. So the corporate tax rate cuts, if they do go through, will not only have the effect that we've already seen of a 15% reduction, but probably another 3 or 4% reduction still to come. And the market is already anticipating that and already reflecting it. So that's my uh, addition. So um, good and, and not so great news, but um, just a quick update on timing. Like as Matt said, we expect that we might see final text uh, out as soon as this Friday, and then the House and the Senate uh, expect to vote on Monday and Tuesday of next week on a final package. So we'll know more next week. And that means the other weekend is the Number to say their name before they speak, please. Oh, sure. Uh, okay, Fred, you have a quick answer. Sure, just really quickly, Fred Blackwell, San Francisco Foundation. I just wanted to uh, mention, I think we're all aware that this is not the only place where there are conversations about uh, housing in the region going on. Uh, the one other place where I'm involved, uh, one of the other places where I'm involved is with uh, Caitlin, as well as uh, uh, a group of partners that includes uh, Facebook and the Ford Foundation that is looking at kind of financing and, and policy related issues as well as it relates to um, the housing crisis, but also thinking about transportation and jobs issues and how they uh, interrelate. And we've had a few meetings now, and in every meeting, uh, someone asks the question how this relates to CASA. Uh, and I think our answer is always we're not sure. Uh, and it's not uh, that we're not sure and we don't care, uh, is that we really don't know. And so what we'd like to do at an upcoming meeting uh, is actually schedule some time to update this group on what we're doing and have a conversation around where some intersections might be. Okay. Um, so you're going to hear this theme, uh, I think, throughout the, uh, the midday here. And that is, as Fred pointed out, there's a lot of activity that you read about every day going on trying to move the housing agenda forward, lots of different groups. And um, I think what that 
causes in your chair when people appear is a sense of urgency in terms of trying to move this organization to get into some real recommendations and decisions. That is a trade-off between uh, you know, over-process versus over -perform. So we're trying to use the methodology that perfection is the enemy of the good. And so today, this is not a day to make uh, big grand bargain decisions. That was not the intent. The intent was to make sure that now that there have been some committee meetings going on, um, some are a little further ahead than others, but nonetheless, try to let those committees bring forward the ideas that they have, uh, see how the rest of the group feels about it, add to those ideas, uh, either in mass or in individuality. We have in front of you again the famous uh, post-its. So if you have any thoughts that come up during the day, uh, if you want to put them down in writing, we'll collect them and we'll, we'll figure out a way to process them during the day. Or if you want to uh, chat as some of the folks are talking, you know, I think this is a good opportunity to do that. Because today is a day to get everybody's input and uh, continue to move this thing down the road where we can hopefully come back and, and utilize the MTC uh, uh, facility, if you will, to bring these ideas to reality. There's a lot of legislation being talked about in Sacramento. There's funding issues, um, as Georgia mentioned, regarding tax credits, obviously still up for grabs that we don't control. But I think we're trying to come up with ways to control the, the balance and act of production, preservation, and protection. So that continues to be our goal. Uh, we are as anxious as we heard in some of the beginning meetings and people wanted to get to it. So we're here to, to push that ball. Um, so we're going to start out, uh, I think Steve is off in another meeting, but the moderators of the committees are going to give a little bit of an update on where they are. I don't know how you guys have planned on doing that. Denise, do you have a format for that? Or? Um, we thought we'd each spend just a few minutes explaining what we've been working on okay. um, very briefly. And then in the part two discussion, the production group has got a kind of a laundry list of ideas. And uh, the other, and we've identified things that folks are starting to come to agreement on and things where folks don't agree that we need to spend more time discussing next year. So our group will go through that conversation and get everyone's feedback and nuance and concerns, kind of daylight, whatever issues that folks have. Um, the other two groups are not ready yet to produce a list, but they will provide some background on what they've been working on. So the way we envision the workshops, I just kind of reiterate, is that uh, part one setting the stage is really going to be sort of more administrative updates of where the groups are in the upcoming meetings. And then part two, the, the, the beginning to talk about what some of the potential elements of a grand bargain would look like. My, that's where, um, before we get there and, and have a detailed discussion, we invite you and the co-chairs co to, to add some framing remarks. Um, and then uh, uh, we'll start with um, Linda and Jennifer, and, and they'll really kind of talk about uh, some of the, the things, the buckets that are forming in their group, uh, and, and lead some dialogue around that, and, and making sure that the buckets are, are sort of, uh, the big buckets are complete enough. And then we'll have a more detailed conversation uh, with Denise and Derek and on the on the preservation. And then um, I will jump in at the end just to kind of ask, check in if anything is missing. And then Fred actually will really wrap up uh, kind of what he's heard today and, and where we're headed uh, from the workshop discussion. Um, and then uh, we'll go into the rest of the agenda. But we've allowed almost two hours for this, and it's really meant to be interactive. Um, and as Mike said, uh, we're going to invite you to use your post-its at any time. And Vikrant, raise your hand, Vikrant. If you just raise them, Vikrant will walk behind us and collect them uh, as, as you have them. So Denise, uh, you and Derek are going to go first. OK, so why don't you introduce yourself and why you're in charge of um, So I'm Denise Pinkston. I am representing the Barrier Council here, um, but I also have my day job is working with Michael to teach part of the developer, and I also am a local zoning administrator, have a planning commissioner. I mean, wear many hats in the housing field. So in that regard, I'm trying to bring all of those industries together in the production we're working with. Yeah. 
And I'm Derek Merns, and I'm with Working Partnerships. We're a community labor alliance out of Silicon Valley that works on issues of the economy and housing comes up um, as a major issue for our low wage workers. Um, I'm co-chairing this group with Denise, and let me just say, Denise Kingston is a force of nature. Um, and I really know, I want the group to really appreciate that Denise not only knows her stuff, but um, you know the urgency that she brings and the commitment and the time that she brings to this work is phenomenal, and I'm very impressed. And we're glad to partner with her. Um, and I would say that our work group um, has, has met three times uh, so far. It feels like a lot. Um, for those of us who are not organized around production and uh, as well organized, it feels like, ah, we've been meeting all the time. But I mean, the urgency is really real. So what I would say is that as we go through today in the next section, um, the ideas, they're not baked fully. They are what's come up. And they're, they're fairly comprehensive. There's not full agreement, and people should be honest and clear and react, but also offer solutions where you can. Um, so, and then just to give you an update about the working group process, um, we've had two meetings. Not everyone can come to every meeting. Um, many of the people in this room have come to at least one of the meetings that we've had. So, thank you for that time. And we initially began with the framework CASA gave us of these big action idea lists that were ranked. Remember, we ranked them all one through five. It turned out everything that was in the production bucket was ranked well over 70%. So we took that to mean there was a strong kind of basic, basic acknowledgement of the goodness of the ideas. And we haven't ruled anything out. So we've more been taking all comers, taking all ideas, and trying to organize them in a way that allows for a detailed, good policy discussion um, and daylights disagreement. So that's kind of what we'll go through um, in a moment. But in terms of our meeting process, um, when we initially did all these rankings, we, we looked at high impact, short term ideas, what will deliver the most number of units the most quickly to provide the most rapid assistance to people who are hurting today. And most of those ideas fell into categories like uh, second units or things that allow developments that are already in the pipeline, either whether they're nonprofit developments or for profit developments, to get to go which means you know, we're relieving cost burdens or relieving regulatory hangups that are keeping projects from getting to gas and getting you know, getting under construction. After going through that exercise, and, and we aren't going to focus on that today because we talked about it at the last technical committee meeting. Um, we talked about a housing emergency. There are so many things that need to be done in the production category that at some point you kind of throw up the cards in the air and you're like, what? Um, we got to do all of this. We've got to do it all now. It's an emergency. We should, with one voice, declare it to be a housing emergency and throw our collective voices together to say the way we've been doing business doesn't work anymore. And we need to elevate and articulate that, that this requires a different kind of attention than we have been able to bring to it here to form. So that was an idea that came out of we talked about it last time. Um, and after sort of going through that process, what we realized is we have so many different pieces of paper and so many good ideas that the best way to get our arms around it as a group is to try and get it on one piece of paper um, and identify high level categories of, of policy interventions that are required to, to, make, to move the needle on housing production. Um, and to, within those, identify a detailed thing. This, this list is in front of you. And also to identify areas where CASA members disagree. So what we'll talk about when we do a more detailed presentation is what are those big categories of housing production ideas? What are the ones where, at least so far, we understand there's disagreement and we need to create space and time next year to unpack that or get more information or just talk to each other some more? and see if we can resolve some of those. Um, and then, uh, and, and so anyway, that's kind of where we are at, and we'll go through the details of where we're at in the next section. Are there any questions? Anyone else on the working group want to report back? Anything? No, Scott. Uh, this is Scott Little-Hale. I'm with the Northern California Carpenters Regional Council. Um, I just wanted to add, to add one perspective on, on the 
topic of production, which is that we uh, as a group have an aspiration where I think there's pretty much common, common vision that the big picture goal is to try to have major increases in supply. The, the Turner Center put out the number that 80% more housing is required in terms of production. And the list that has been generated perhaps uh, to date probably is 95% focused on two elements of production, really pre-production, which is entitlements and the regulations around entitlements, and the capital side of production. What has been missing is, is frankly, uh, the labor side of, of production. If we want to produce 80,000 more units statewide in Northern California share of that, that would require 120,000 additional construction workers. And as Carol Galante of the Turner Center had said at, one, at the session when she presented, the housing production ecosystem seems to be broken as far as an adequate supply of contractors and skilled workforce goes, specifically the pipeline for residential building construction. Just to illustrate that point and that distinction, the Bay Area, relative to the housing boom year of 2005, now has 10,000 fewer carpenters working as of 2016. That's overall. At the same time, the carpenters' union is at peak levels of employment and work hours, which is predominantly not in the residential sector. So it shows that the issue is more isolated to something being broken in the residential pipeline for work with skilled workforce. And so we find people that are most skilled shifting into other industries because that those other industries have greater employment stability, less are less dangerous to life and limb. There are fewer work-life balance trade-offs. Uh, there's a big difference between getting up at 5.30 in the morning and disappearing from your family versus uh, going out the door at 7 uh, a.m. And all of this has been associated in the residential building industry with a casual workforce development system, if you want to, if you can even call it really a system that has no binding commitments by its participants to, to training and to building the human capital. So the proposal that, that I presented to Denise, and which she's, uh, uh, I believe, and, and Derek, which I believe they're on board with, is to try to have, in 2018, a production working group session dedicated to trying to pull together the sorts of players who can really start to get their heads around not the pre-con, not the pre-construction entitlement side, not the capital side, as much as the, the actual production ecosystem of it when it comes to contractors, skilled labor, and making, making those forces combine with, with, uh, with a propitious environment, regulatory environment, and capital environment. So that's my addition. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else that folks want to bring up, just at the kind of summary level? We're going to get into the details shortly. Sure. Um, Andreas Kluber, Alameda County Building Trades Council. I, I think I would second um, uh, Scott's concerns um, regarding the supply of labor and the pipeline issues. And I actually, I think it penetrates not just production but also preservation because I think with this massive uh, labor shortage, shortage that we're facing, if we're really going to build out as we, as we plan to, um, it also provides a great opportunity to train local folks and, and, and disadvantaged residents and folks in poverty uh, that are now being, you know, the real victims of the housing crisis to get into these jobs, building the housing and building to be, to get those middle class incomes and wages uh, that will allow them to actually kind of get into the, to the housing market. So having said that, I do think it's, um, it would be important to kind of focus a discussion on the, at least on the production side. Uh, around these labor issues and kind of brainstorm about what we can be doing uh, to address this issue because I think, you know, all these plans in terms of this, this massive housing build out that we'd like to see, that there's not skilled labor in the, and also let's recognize we're competing with work, workers going to Texas, going to Florida, uh, going to the North Bay um, with all the disasters that we're having. And LA now too, right? Yeah, of course. So, so it's, you know, the shortage, like, we have to address it, but it's also an opportunity to help a lot of folks, uh, you know, that are victims right now um, of the housing crisis to, 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 to get into the yeah. And I'm just going to put a kicker on this. I apologize. Um, 
It was said by Turner that construction costs are between 50 to 70 percent of total development costs. If we lower costs for entitlements, which are maybe you know, 15 to 20 percent of costs, those will be overwhelmed if we continue to have just a, this massive surge in demand for housing production. Just continue to drive up those hard costs. Performance, that pro forma equation that is so difficult to get to work nowadays, will only get harder to get to work. We will not be able to attain boosts in entitlement, and not in boosts in, in production of actual housing for people, to shelter people. All excellent points that we will take time to talk about some more questions. Anything else, just at the high level, we'll, we'll get into details in a moment. So I think that summarizes sort of the update from the production. Okay. <clears throat> so we've started more of the uh, preservation and protection. So, um, I want to still leave it up with it. Uh, Jennifer's going to start us off, and then I'm going to talk specifically about preservation. Okay. So, the Protection and Preservation Group has started to meet. We met um, in November for the first time, and our second meeting is tomorrow. Unfortunately, we weren't able to schedule it before the technical committee meeting. Um, and we have um, two more meetings scheduled uh, to vet the protection and preservation ideas. Um, so for those of you who are interested in joining us tomorrow, we're going to be at 369 Pine from 9 to 12 tomorrow morning. Um, the important thing, I think, is that what we've done is we've broken up the conversation into significant buckets of discussion. We're bringing in experts on each area um, because not everyone at the table has the level of expertise to kind of know the nuances of the policies we're discussing with the intent of trying to elevate a couple of um, big ideas that we might bring to the technical committee for the process of negotiation in a, in a, in a grand bargain concept. So that's where we're at right now. We aim to be completed with some of that in, you know, those initial discussions of floating ideas by February, um, which would include also a thorough um, discussion of the preservation ideas, which have only recently really been looked at. And I'll pass it off to Linda for that. So and I just want to add to what Jennifer said about the buckets that we're looking at here. So we're looking at um, how we how might we help cities with the administration of, of all of the stuff they're already doing. What might we do to help them with administration of current rent control law? help them with the hordes of tenants that are showing up at their city council hearings uh, and come up with solutions that really give people some real-time assistance, uh, not just something that is a five-year state legislative process. So we've been looking at that. We're also looking at what can we do directly to help tenants uh, and how might we incent landlords uh, to do the right thing. Uh, and so those are the sort of three big buckets and preservation is the fourth bucket. And Matt Schwartz and Amy Fishman have been co-chairing an effort to really put out a bunch of ideas on this. You have in your packet the big high impact action ideas that we circulated that have been uh, voted on. Um, I'm going to just walk through what they are generally, but if people want to ask uh, Jennifer Wright any questions, we invite participation in our committee. We have had some very good conversations, and I would say we're looking not just at legislation, we're looking at practical policy. Uh, including what might the state of California do with housing development law to incent localities to better protect tenants. So that's uh, where we're coming from. So on uh, preservation, you'll see on page, I don't think the packet has a page number, but it looks like this. Um, the ideas are to adopt a regional no net loss policy uh, to condition regional transportation funding on rigorous enforcement of housing preservation law. Uh, ensure that preservation of affordable housing stock is uh, included in funding measures as a criteria. Uh, and that's actually, I think, where housing element law might be an addition to the list of things we might consider thinking about. Investigate the use of corporate and municipal treasury funds. This one didn't get a lot of votes, but um, I personally like it with my day job uh, and how you can use these kinds of funds to uh, acquire, renovate, and preserve housing. Um, uh, promote and enforce condominium conversion laws uh, that give tenants the right to acquire their units. Provide technical assistance and funding for seismic retrofitting. This was hugely popular because I think nobody can argue that this is a good thing for most of us. Um, and construction techniques that preserve housing. And then last but not least um, is adopt Ellis Act reform to prevent SROs from being converted to market rate hotels. So that's our current list. Uh, 
Amy and Nat have done, I want to just give them a shout out and ask if they want to add anything about kind of what they're thinking has been on this list. But um, we have a robust list of things that we're talking about and would welcome participation. I'll just, <clears throat> this is Matt Schwartz, California Housing Partnership. We'll note one area that we hope to add to this list is a recently passed bill, Assembly Bill 1521. Uh, by Assemblymember Bloom from Santa Monica that dramatically expands the state preservation notice law and gives new tools to tenants, to cities, to developers who want to acquire and preserve these properties. So I think we'll be spending some time, I hope, at one of the upcoming meetings on uh, potential uses of that law for everyone. I just want to add that I know that um, Fred and Caitlin, that the uh, Chan Zuckerberg San Francisco Foundation piece is really focusing on preservation. We actually had a bunch of ideas come out of our first working group meeting where we think we could really collaborate with that effort, that it, it, it might really be a place where there's some merging of those two efforts. So we look forward to talking to you about that. Um, in our group, just naturally, there's some cross colonization of thinking, which is really, really helpful. I think some ideas that have come out in the production group that probably belong in the protection preservation group. One of them was commented on at our last meeting, which is um, to develop neighborhood stabilization programs for um, particularly low-income home ownership neighborhoods that are at risk of gentrification and of displacement. There's some good models elsewhere in the state of uh, both combining community bank financing, which Robert Alpadaka talked about, um, using ADUs as a technical tool to help homeowners have another source of income, sort of foreclosure prevention, uh, intergenerational living, family stabilization by allowing and, and providing technical assistance and finance and permit assistance to low-income homeowners who need another source of money to pay the bills. Um, LA Moss is a nonprofit organization that's doing this in LA and has been, gotten a number of grant funded programs to expand what they're doing in low income Latino neighborhoods in LA. I think it would be good to kind of work on that in the Bay Area. So maybe that's, maybe I'm handing that baton to you guys after today, but if not, you got it on our list too, so we don't lose the thought as we continue to move forward. Great. So um, first, I just, I think on behalf of the other two co-chairs, I think when we look at the uh, frequency of the meetings and the duration of the meetings and the quality of the product, I for one want to express my appreciation for the amount of work that is uh, going into this. I, I know that it's no uh, small task to get everybody in the room and have a productive conversation that can produce something like this. Um, I guess I have a question and a request. Um, I mean, it seems to me that the, the balancing act that we're all trying to strike is on the one hand, we're looking for um, solutions at a regional level of scale. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the region is um, an accumulation of a bunch of jurisdictions, very specific uh, local places. and. Um, different jurisdictions have differences in terms of vulnerability for displacement uh, and gentrification, um, what kinds of development opportunities are uh, present in those different places, uh, and the political climate uh, in terms of development, whether it's single family, multifamily, um, market rate, affordable. And so it, it seems like at some point, at the working group level, there needs to be a mapping uh, of what we are talking about because I would imagine that for these strategies, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Some are more appropriate for different types of jurisdictions, while some might be um, actually appropriate for the region in general. And so I'm hoping that as we get to the stage where uh, the Turner Center and the Center for Urban Displacement are bringing data and research, that, that data and research is both uh, kind of brought to us at a regional level of scale, but also broken down by place and by race, because I think the different races and ethnicities are also experiencing the housing crisis uh, in, a, in different ways. And to Andreas's point, 
uh, around the employment piece of this, I think that there's an employment piece of this that also needs to take race in place and pipeline into account as well. So I, I hope that we get to that level of uh, uh, specificity somewhere down the line. Yeah, I, I want to appreciate those comments and also just echo that um, we're taking on a vast topic and there is so many ways to, to get at this issue and it, we have a sense of urgency but there's also a sense that we're moving really fast and it's hard to determine where there's exactly consensus or agreement or disagreement and so I what I want to appreciate about where we've, uh, our discussions in production work so far, I think we've highlighted the issues for further discussion and we've tested where there is some agreement, but we've also tested what the hot button issues are. And so um, I think that this, this list identifies issues for further discussion. So it, it's, it's a little bit hard because we don't have unlimited time and there is so much to discuss. So I look forward to that process that Fred was saying about what you know what are those stages of the discussion? When do we move from uh, what what are our goals? How do we identify where we disagree? What are you know what are the the key issues of disagreement? Can we come to some compromise on that? Or can you know what can we agree on? And then um, <coughs> kind of go through a process to uh, maybe starting with the things that we can all agree with and, and then getting to the really hard ones and seeing how we come up with a package that we can live with. It's, it's a little daunting to imagine that process and we may need to break out into different types of subcommittees or, or different types of presentations. Um, but I, I know that, um, for example, for the affordable housing community, whether you know, two-thirds of our funding is available or not based on what happens with the tax reform program is, is going to um, be really important with how this process proceeds. How we implement the package of legislation uh, that was just passed, uh, so some of these ideas uh, have needed to evolve based on that. So there's, it's, we're sort of in a rapidly evolving environment and I want to appreciate everyone's contributions to that conversation. Uh, and I think we all reserve our right to evolve our thinking <laughs> as, as this moves forward. Um, so we're in, but it, this is a daunting task and one that's needed to be done. So thank you. Yeah, I, I, oh, sorry. So I just want to comment on this because I, I took this program at Harvard and we had to do a performance challenge and they described the challenge as uh, bigger than a bread box, but smaller than world peace, right? And so I feel like we're in this grappling with the assignment has been there are no boundaries. So we've made it very large. And I think what we've been talking in the protection working group, we've been sort of talking about it on two levels. And I'm going to use just cause eviction as an example because we spent a lot of time talking about what could you do in the space of just cause? Could we adopt a region wide just cause ordinance? What could we do what we did with NPH and the home builders many years ago on inclusionary and introduce a set of principles and go city to city and educate them on what the good principles would be in a just cause ordinance, get them up to speed on why they might adopt one, and then get HCD to give you points in your housing element for doing it. And so I think with this where are we going thing, we are challenged with the swing for the fences choice, which is the home run. And, and how do we get a bunch of singles at the same time? And I think we have to really start thinking about that. And, and I think in every one of these talks, we should ask ourselves, if it's gonna take us 10 years to swing for the fences, what can we do between now and 10 years from now? And, and I think that's the way the preservation group has been really starting to think about this, because I think there's things we can do that may not require Sacramento. And for those of us who work in Sacramento, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's really hard. And so it takes a long time. So I think we have to have that kind of lens. I just, if I could, Michael, um, Tamika Moss with Hamilton Families. I just wanted to comment that I think some of what I'm hearing is that the, the sort of interplay between all of the working groups may be the sort of connected tissue that actually creates a more holistic strategy. And I think that, you know, Andreas and Scott's comments about um, the labor piece is actually not just in the production. It's also in the preservation. If we're talking about anti-poverty approaches that actually are looking at how do we create a region we all want and care about, 
it's about affordability and jobs as well. And so I, I want us to also think about a more holistic approach that's rooted in our values. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about the specific tangible pieces that we're trying to, and we still don't know because we're trying to do both at the same time, Linda, I think your point is well taken, but I also think we should get pretty explicit pretty soon about what are our non-negotiables and what are we really trying, what kind of region do we want and what are the tools that are going to maximize that impact and if it's an accumulative approach where we take the highest yield opportunities in each of the working groups to advance those values, I think that that's a way to think about it. But I, I'm getting to a place where I'm not clear about what our non-negotiables are in terms of do we want to preserve the middle class? Do we want to see um, you know, low-income people actually come out of poverty? Do we want to make sure that there's a region that is ethnic, ethnically and culturally reflective of our, of our Bay Area values? And I think that those pieces have to, at some point, um, come into view for us to really decide what are the singles and what are the home runs. Yeah. Well, as uh, just short of world peace is, I think if you look at our title, it's the Committee to House the Bay Area. So <laughs> it's not world peace, but it does cover a broad spectrum. And I think that as we talked about earlier on with the silos, everybody's in a silo and everybody has their perspective, but this is a group that's trying to get outside of their own silo and work with the greater good. Uh, so the other thing is that there is a possibility, Denise and I have talked about this, for what we would call leakage. Um, there could be some ideas that you know they have their own life, they have their own ability to get done, stuff that the politicians in Sacramento are already talking about that may be on our list. So they may just pick up a life of their own, and, you know, they're being supported, there's lots of politicians out there now who have a housing mantra. And so we, we shouldn't get in the way of that. We should support those ideas when they come up, but they may be on a list here and, and end up not being part of a grand bargain per se, but they're out there getting done. So when you take a holistic macro, we're here to house the Bay Area. It doesn't matter how it gets done. It doesn't matter who does it, um, but that's the challenge. And so it, it is the battle between perfection and, and good, and, it, and it's a, the battle between you know, 24 meetings and one, two, three, go. So that we're going we're gonna to continue to battle that. Today is an effort, as I said early, to get the ideas out. And maybe as a methodology, uh, we could go through all items that are in red and sort of have a conversation. Uh, you know, if we're going to talk about the items that are not automatic, we'll assume the automatics are easy, but the reds may not be, and are they critical to Barman Young? Yeah, I just want to say that I think the red, the ones in red are the ones that we are clear where there are issues, but there are other ones that are not in, in red that I think the wording or the framing or the actual goal is we're still pretty far apart or still need more discussion on them. So just to give an example, um, I think that we all are probably here believing that MTC can play a really critical role and this, the MTC AVAG merger with your, whatever your Bay Area Metro or whatever your new name is, um, the idea of how big housing and transportation together, and we know that transportation funding incentivizes behavior that we want uh, around issues where jurisdictions are more resistant. And so the what is hardest to do in jurisdictions is to build affordable housing and to prevent displacement of lower income communities. And that is the, the, the tool that I think we all very much believe in. We also know that we do need some market rate housing and in different parts of the region that market rate housing could be uh, more affordable to people and then in other parts of the region it is completely unaffordable to everyone and maybe it's luxury homes for um, people who have their you know, second or third homes. And so I think that what is that behavior that we want to incentivize that had, looks different around the region based on the micro markets that we have is, is, is not really boiled into the sort of one-liner here. But I think that what the one-liner here that was captured is that's a conversation that we need to dig further in to see what is the outcome that we want. Um, because we, we want to see more affordability as we grow. Uh, and, and, and so how do you get there? Um, so thank you. I, I would like to, I want to just I'd like to continue to frame the concept. We're trying to build as much housing of every type that we can, and the missing middle is missing. 
So if we focus on just affordability or uh, uh, just the homeless issue, which are A plus items, we will miss the opportunity to get the carpenters back to live in the Bay Area with their wages and, and that missing middle. And to be honest, you know, if a, if a condominium has millionaires living at the top, and we can create a system that creates cash flow out of that to fund homelessness uh, improvements and to fund affordability. That's part of the metric. So every time I hear we, we are focused on maybe the right or the wrong, I'd like to have the inclusionary aspect be we should be focused on every kind of housing we can build. And, and the comments about the costs are absolutely right. I don't know anybody in the room who's a production builder who's building a new housing project today with today's metrics, because it's really hard. They have the same problems that uh, the affordability group does and the poverty uh, homeless group does. That, um, it's just that all the housing elements are stressed. If they weren't, something would be working well. And we could draft off of that. So I just I just want to just put that framework back out there. That this is our, our joint <coughs> agenda is home housing the Bay Area. Top to bottom left to right. So, uh, can I interject first? Okay. So, one of the conversations we've been having as the working group co chairs is this just what we've started to do, which is identifying what are the big, um, what are the things that we as uh, representatives of different sectors and different constituencies in this room need to see reflected in a, a grand bargain in order for us to get behind it and put our political will behind it. So an example, and I'm not, I don't want to speak for Michael or others, but an example might be we need to make sure that with affordability we're also tackling the missing middle. It, for others it might be something else. Um, so I'm wondering if this is the right moment to shift a little bit to that convert, get into that conversation since it seems to be what people are really itching to do and name what is it we need to come away with so that when we go into this next phase going into 2018 and negotiate, we know what we're aiming for together. Yeah. And we know what we might have, where, where there might be some values points of conflict that we have to negotiate through. Um, and you know, this could be, for example, a high level goal. It might also be a really specific goal in terms of, you know, we need to see half a million households protected by, you know, from displacement. So, you know, I think that one of the things we're going to do, and we're so we can, we've been really struggling, I, Linda and I, you know, I think it took us about a month to figure out what we were asked to do. We were <laughs> invited to be these, these co chairs of this working group, so thank you for your patience. But now that we're more clear and we recognize what we've been struggling around, we're going to sit down next week to try to map out what 2018 looks like to get us to some of those more in-depth negotiation-like conversations. And uh, knowing where people need to get to would really help us figure that out so that we can make our conversations more productive and meaningful. Um, so is it all right if we switch to that? moment. Yeah, I, that's well said, by the way. So I'm going to, um, with the permission of, of uh, Michael and the co-chairs, try and bring a little um, structure to uh, the rest of the workshop. So, um, and Jennifer, I'm going to follow up on that idea. So first, let me just do a time management um, thing. Uh, one, food is in the back, uh, and, and I just invite uh, people to get up and, and get food and bring it to your desks or your, your chairs. Um, uh, so please feel free to get up at any time. In terms of our time, we have until, um, we had scheduled until 1.10 for this part, but we're already at noon. So uh, what I'm gonna propose is that we are gonna um, shift the community outreach to after the public comment, uh, but we're still gonna have a hard stop at 1.25 for the public comment. And then we'll have uh, Vic Front uh, present the community outreach and then Ken and Darren will squeeze uh, their pieces down or we'll push some of that to uh, the next meeting. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, just really, I think, trying to figure out, you know, here in December where we want to go next year. And Jennifer, I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt. Yes. Um, I do think that the 
community engagement and process should be done before public comment, okay. if possible. Okay. So we'll, we'll keep it at the same time, and then after public comment, we'll just grab another 15 minutes of the workshop maybe to wrap up. Does that sound good to everybody? Okay, so just in, in terms of, of sort of the conversations I've been having with um, some of the work group uh, moderators and with the co-chairs, I just want to give you a little picture of sort of how these things are, are hopefully going to fit together. Um, so indulge me for one second. So we've got CASA up here, okay? That's, that's us and the steering committee. What, what I'm hearing from a number of you, and thank you, uh, you know, to Scott and to Andreas and to Amy and to all of you, is we need to have some clarity around the big goals. Why, why did you come and sit at this table and why are you going to all of these meetings, right? So these are kind of our value statements or our big goals that, that, that might be around making sure we have the construction labor force we need or we're going to build a certain number of units. And then we have our stools, right? Our three P's. Protection, production. Can you write a little bigger? Uh, I can. In fact, I'm going to get Vikrant, Gurang Vikrant, to write better than me uh, as I say it, so he will transcribe. Um, so let me just go over again. We've got the steering committee and the technical committee up here. The very first meeting, we had you go around on camera very intentionally so we can capture it and bring it back why you're here, but we're going to do that in a few minutes today. Then we've got the three stools, and then we have what you see is potentially the beginning of a framework. Not Don't look at the words for a minute, but look at these big, bold statements, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And as Amy said, who's a member, and Denise and Derricka, these are starters, but when we talk about elements, um, these are some of what, what elements might be. Elements are, um, uh, the sort of the what, Vikrant, can you fan away from me over here? Um, doesn't look like he's in his lavender shirt, just call him um, something masculine equivalent. Um, the what and the how, okay? So, CASA, big goals, and then put this framework up under the big goal. Does that make sense to everybody? Does everybody say, if you, okay, if it makes sense, raise your hand, because I don't see anybody nodding. Okay, so imagine that there are pieces of paper like the production group has done. One might sit under production. One might sit under preservation. One might sit under protection. I think there are pieces missing. We talked about the labor pieces missing. I think the city pieces are missing, right? Okay, so we want to start to build just this outline today, regardless of whether we have content that we agree on. So I want to invite some questions and comments on that. Can people visualize that? Okay, raise your hand if you can visualize it. So I'm not reading any body language. <laughs> okay, okay. So where we want to go today is that we're going to start with the co-chairs sharing a few of their thoughts about what the grand bargain is about. Um, and, and I also want to take a few minutes, so maybe we'll do this while we get our lunch and then we'll have the co-chair share. I'd like everybody to write why, why you're here at CASA. Not, not I'm personally here because of X, but, but pretty much what Mike said. Mike said, I'm here because I want to make sure we get on housing for every single person, uh, all the different income levels in the Bay Area. Is that pretty close? Um, so that is part of the big goal, right? You just heard um, Scott and Andreas say, we want to make sure, I'm paraphrasing, that we actually build out a construction worker economy, right? That we have the workforce we need to get our, our, our needs met. So I'd like you to take a few minutes now to get lunch and write these down, and Vikram's going to collect them, and then we're going to come back and the co-chairs are going to share sort of their vision of the grand bargain, and then Denise and Derricka are going to begin to outline these big things, okay, what their, their buckets are. And then Denise and, I mean, Jennifer and Linda, and then Denise and Derek, in the most detail, are going to walk you all through this and lead a discussion. So um, let's take five minutes and uh, write your ideas down for the um, different not collect them. Yes, Denise. Can I ask just for a nuance? I think what Jennifer has asked for is sort of what you're saying, but slightly nuanced, which is 
And so maybe if people could do both, it would be helpful. One is aspirationally, why are you here? The other one is what is your must have? What do you leave in the table if you don't get? And I think we need to identify both. And, and, and that's really what uh, Tamika said. So you can do both. Um, raise your hand as you're done and we'll collect them. Um, Jennifer, did I capture what you were also asking about in terms of the big goals? Yeah, I mean, I think the goals. Lovely. Yeah, if it, it, like what are the collective goals you need to aim for? And then what are the what's the must have that you need to see come out of this? Yeah. And if you could specify so we don't have to interpret, that would be terrific. Um, so again, we're going to take 10 minutes. Uh, let's slowly get up and get your food. Let's write those things down in about uh, 12, 20, no later than 12, 20. These guys are going to share uh, sort of their vision, and then we're going to move into the work groups. Right. So we want to try to get as much on the table as we can during that time process. In the, uh, in the spirit of efficiency, we've also noted Fred to be the summarizer of the three co-chairs and how we look at this. So we get that one of these guys a sandwich. So uh, Fred, if you want to try to see if you can get the group up and back or over here our versions world piece. Sure. Um, and I will try to be brief because I actually felt like um, the comments that were made by Tamika, you, Amy, and Jennifer right before break were uh, taking us in the right direction and you know in the danger of, of kind of repeating stuff that I may have said uh, a couple of meetings ago. Um, I think all three of us decided to do this because we were hoping that it would be a process that was uh, different from uh, the ones that we participated in in the past. Uh, and I, I think that the the characteristics of the kinds of processes that we have participated in the past that we did not want to repeat is that uh, everybody kind of just did a parallel play uh, and where we all uh, had our favorite list. Uh, we bring that favorite list uh, into the room and share it with one another and think that that's uh, collaboration and we end up uh, at the end of the day with a laundry list of recommendations and ideas in a report and even more importantly none of our actions change uh, in terms of how we think about and advocate for uh, the piece of the list that we associate with ourselves uh, in other words the way that that uh, looks is that you know you'll be uh, in the legislator's office in Sacramento and you'll say, I don't know what those other folks were thinking, but I really, uh, Mr. Legislator or Mrs. Legislator would like you to focus in on my issue, uh, even though uh, you've sat around this table with everybody else for 18 months. Uh, and so uh, what we are thinking and hoping a grand bargain looks like in the context of the conversations that we are having uh, with you is that we move uh, beyond uh, advocacy for our favorite ideas and move to a place uh, where we are willing to advocate for a package of things that we can agree to uh, that we uh, want to see happen. Whether that is um, advocacy in Sacramento, advocacy at, a, um, a, at the ballot box or for a piece of uh, an initiative, or advocacy for some very local actions that we would like to see uh, take place. And so, in shorthand, what we are hoping is that we can get to a, a higher common denominator rather than the lowest common denominator uh, among us, and that we can get to a point where people can have a conversation around what they're willing to give up in order to get what they really want. Uh, and so uh, I would say for us, that is what we envision uh, this process being. And I think that we uh, have some uh, ways to go in terms of thinking about what the vehicle uh, for that kind of grand bargain might be. Uh, I think we all three of us know it's not a report. Um, uh, and so we will need to think about that piece as well. And maybe I can uh, throw out some ideas that I have that others have uh, been talking about in terms of a, a vehicle uh, closer to the end of this. Resonate with everybody? Get a sense that it's uh, it's not the normal process, and again, we have the auspices of the MTC as our facilitator. So, so 
sir. And uh, thank you. you. Want to say hello? I do want to say hello. And uh, I, I, you know, it's always easier for me when Fred speaks before me because I can usually just say what he said. You're not on my well, it's on. There yeah, it is. apologize for being late today. I was in a closed session with my board about litigation, so believe me, this, this meeting is an improvement over where I've been. Um, and we do hold out a lot of hope for this effort. Um, and I think that hope depends on goodwill, which I've seen plenty of in your prior meetings. It depends on good ideas, which again, I've seen plenty of uh, from many of you, not just in these meetings but elsewhere. Um, but I think it's also going to require some sacrifice. Um, and I think that is still an open question. Whether or not uh, each of us is willing to sort of move off our ideal world uh, and our 100% home run and see whether we can uh, sell for something less for the good of the region. Um, and I, I don't think we're going to be asking anybody here uh, to sacrifice your principles. Um, we're not going to be asking anybody here uh, to cross a bridge that is just a bridge too far. Uh, but it does strike me um, as a relative newcomer to the housing conversation uh, that there is plenty of space uh, for agreement that stops well short of those uh, red lines. Um, so I, I certainly hope uh, that we will make that progress, and I'm glad that we're starting to sharpen the focus today. So again, well, thanks. Okay, so uh, we have two of our moderators come up from presentation. So Jennifer Martinez and Linda Mancini, we're going to let you, uh, they're going to describe for you if you want, but come up and sort of lead through your, your buckets. Come on up, Jennifer. I'll give you the mic. trust here. Okay, so this may in fact get modified as we examine those goals and kind of must-haves um, in the context of our co-chair groups uh, or co-chair conversation and we map out 2018. Um, but at the, at the moment, what has been identified through the vetting of the list that was distributed early on in our conversations and the ranking of those lists, uh, or of that list, as well as um, some articulation of new ideas that weren't included there, we've identified four buckets that we're, we're deep, doing some deep dive examination on. Linda has already said them, we're gonna re-articulate them. And in each of these buckets are a set of distinct policy concepts that we are in a cross-sector kind of way um, looking at in terms of what seems possible that we might agree on and then we're asking um, Turner Center and Mary I never know what your organization the urban displacement project sorry urban displacement project at UC Berkeley to do some um, research around to understand the implications of the proposals so that's kind of what's happening. And the four buckets are um, looking at policy uh, level solutions that can be implemented at either the local or state level. Um, that would include things like um, just cause for eviction is one example of that, but there's a series of policy level city and statewide solutions that are possible. The second bucket has to do with direct aid to tenants. An example of that is legal aid, like a, a regional fund for legal aid to tenants um, that reaches a certain scale that's significant enough to keep tenants in their homes. Um, a third uh, the third bucket has to do with how do we incentivize um, behavior that would keep tenants in our communities, um, whether that be incentivizing and supporting on the landlord side or on the city side in some kind of way. So what are some incentives? And then the fourth bucket has to do with preservation, which is, as many of our issues are, also a protection component. 
And so, you know, there's a whole category, as you saw on that list, of preservation ideas of how do we preserve housing that at the moment is affordable to um, working people and low-income people, but might not be affordable if it were to turn over and um, it be aimed at a different um, income category. So there's a whole set of preservation ideas that we're also going to be looking at. And then we'll take these ideas, vet them through a lens, get some research done about them, and then bring the high the highest level cons or the highest level ideas, the highest impact ideas, highest agreement ideas to um, the technical committee for consideration as part of the grant bargain. Is that more or less? Oh, so there's other things that people think are missing. Is do we want people to just call them out right now, or write them down? Okay. So I think on, on behalf of Jennifer and Linda, we just want to take a few minutes uh, to ask uh, on the protection side and the preservation side, these are the beginnings of the buckets. Are there, is there anything missing here in terms of framing sort of the bigger elements of these pieces? Uh, and I'll invite you just to call them out. And if you call them out, I'll also invite you to please write them down. If you don't want to call them out, write them down and hold them up and we'll collect them and add them to the list. Or questions for Jennifer and Linda at, at this point for a few minutes. Can I ask an over question? Yep. Which is in, on your list, do you perceive uh, some, many of these as quote controversial? All of the in terms of motherhood appetite or financeability. What are, what are the Absolutely. issues? Absolutely. What are the issues that are red? I mean, I, I think some of them are, you know, the, the real question for us around um, anti gouging legislation has come up, so that would look maybe something like. Um, <clears throat> usury laws as applied to tenancy. You know, we're really trying to think about where are they? We've had a lot of conversation at our last meeting because we looked specifically at rent control. Rent is, that, control. Is, that, is that in the execution part or on this grand list? It might be on the list, right? So so I think the question for us is, is when we look at the list, what seems, you know, where are the political hot buttons is a big question that we're asking ourselves because I think, um, if they're really super controversial, they're going to go on that swing for the fences list that's going to take a little longer than maybe something that might not be quite so hard. And you know, I think we're going to have to weigh that with this list because some of the stuff, you know, rent control has been on this list. You know, eliminate cost of Hopkins. Those kinds of things are not easy to do, and they're not going to happen fast unless, of course, the ballot initiative succeeds. But but I think those things really matter. So. We're talking about that because we also think some of this stuff really is Sacramento and some of it really could happen regionally. And so we're trying to pick those out as we think about this. Well, I'm just trying to relate to this. If I'm on the right page, this sideways list is the list, right? Mike, that's the detail. All that detail would go under this bucket of preservation. Right. Um, and, and just sort of in terms of how... The cost of Hawkins isn't listed here as a... So is it under the sub-list of how to execute some of these broad protections? I'm trying to figure out where it costs a lot. So the, so, the preser so the protections specific um, ideas were discussed, I think, in October uh, with, a set, with a list. So the packet from October should have that list. We can redistribute it via email as well. Um, but that was brought forward over the summer and then brought back to the group in October with some other rankings that people had preferences on and Costa Hawkins is on that, um, as well as other protections. This particular list that you're looking at is um, about preservation. Because those are actually less controversial than the, some of the protection ones. Okay, so uh, hearing, did anybody have uh, any other comments on, for Jennifer and Linda before we shift to Denise and Derricka? I did, Jennifer. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Matt Schwartz, California Housing Partnership. I, I appreciate the focus on Jennifer and Linda on state and local policy, but I want to, I've got a guess that if there's an opportunity to uh, protect a resource or advance uh, a policy at a federal level, that would be acceptable as well. Bring it on, brother. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, we just got to figure out what this body can actually accomplish together. I think that's part probably towards the end of our negotiation process, but it would be 
put it on the list. Yep. Yeah. Apologies if you if this was in one of the buckets and I missed it, but whether there was a discussion of emergency rental assistance or some other kind of subsidy for rent, like a voucher program or something like uh, an increased voucher program as a form of protection. Yeah, that's a the, we're actually going to get into detail on that tomorrow, and we're considering that to be in the bucket of direct benefits to tenants, and it could be any number of things like that, or legal assistance, or maybe other ideas that folks have. Thank you. And, and, and just in terms of how information should flow and where ideas should go, all ideas now are going through the work group process. So, uh, you know, Fred uh, acknowledged there are a lot, everybody is working very hard in this room, and, and lots of things are going on uh, in different, in different uh, organizations. So. You know, if you have ideas, you can run them through Linda and Jennifer, or you can run them through Denise and Derricka, and that's and so let's you know just keep sending your ideas through the committee process, and, and they'll get vetted there. Okay, to shift now. Um, so again, if you have ideas, uh, feel free to put them on your post-it and slap them up over here on the board. We're going to shift to um, Denise and Derricka, who have until one o'clock. Um, and do you guys need some space to write on? Uh, yes. Do you, we can leave you this far corner, or we can leave you that little spot behind Leslie? Okay. Thank you. Here, Denise. So do, do Denise. Hear me without the mic? I, I think oh, it yeah, needs to be right. taped. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So what we're going to do now is we're all going to look at this production committee list and together and identify things that might be missing entirely. Um, spend some time trying to understand what these one-liners mean. So this is really shorthand for, you know, reams of papers worth of actual details. So make sure we all have a common understanding of the shorthand. And then identify whether you're, we've identified on this piece of paper in red and um, in italics, things that have come up in the production working group where there is clearly either disagreement or uh, a, you know, that we need more time to kind of unpack where people are coming from to know where we might find common agreement. Uh, and there may be other things on this list uh, that, that require similar um, time and attention that we just didn't identify in the production working group because the folks who have those concerns didn't happen to be in the room at the time these ideas were generated. So that's what I'm hoping to accomplish in the next half hour. So walk through these fairly quickly um, and see kind of where people are and how much folks think are good ideas and things where they think it needs to be nuanced or further on. Okay? And this is going to be a little more fast moving and free flowing just because there's a lot of this and I want to make sure people get time. So um, well, let's just see how we do. All right, so we have six buckets, six big categories of ideas in the production working group. The first one is that we need more and more different types of homes in every neighborhood. This is, production is not just about big multifamily buildings, which are a lot of where the time and energy and disputes happen. This is about housing everywhere in every neighborhood and more density throughout the Bay Area in every part of every community. Uh, the second one is that cost is a problem, as, as Scott pointed out, and we have to reduce the cost of units built in more locations. So costs across the board, but also, you know, that, so the costs come down in, in more different kinds of places. Um, third bucket is streamlining. It, it is very hard to get to yes on housing. We all understand that. There were a number of bills passed about that topic. We're still not done with that topic. And so we need to talk more about how to reduce delay and cost and improve compliance with state housing law so that every city is making its fair share contribution to the housing picture and every housing project has a decent shot at getting approved um, in, in every locality. Four, there needs to be, so these are sort of short-term things that would help housing move more quickly. Long term, to really have a whole lot more housing in California for the next generation of Californians, we need to change our state's fiscal policy so that cities want more housing. It becomes their favorite land use. It becomes the one that they get more money from. And today, that is not true. Every fiscal incentive for cities is aligned against housing. And if we don't talk and fix 
talk about that and try to come up with some ideas for fixing it. Every one of the other ideas we have here will be like a 20-year game of whack-a-mole. We'll think of an idea for how to fix this problem, and then there'll be some other way to stop that solution tomorrow. We have to make cities want to do more housing, or, or long run, it won't happen. Um, five, we know we need more long-term sources of affordable housing subsidy at a much greater scale than are currently available, and that's a whole conversation unto itself. And then finally, if, if we don't start talking about the housing market as a fundamentally broken system of regulations and incentives and sticks and carrots, we, we do the whole issue an injustice. We get lost in the weeds and we get lost in our silos. And it's important to remember this is an emergency. It affects everybody in the Bay Area and to talk about it in that way so that people don't lose sense of the urgency of moving all these issues forward. So those are the those are our big six buckets. So before we dive into the weeds, I know that you may think that something's missing and it's in a detailed line on it, but any reaction to the big six buckets? Okay, we're going to keep going. Oh, yep. So I, I, I'm at the risk of taking you off, uh, Denise. You can tell me this comes later, so I'll, I'm, I'm happy to stand down. <laughs> so I think that I think the list is great. I'm probably one of those weird people who likes most, if not everything, on the list. Um, what I'm really confused about is um, something that's not here but relates to housing production or production in general, which is we have we have a this really really to your last comment, which is we actually have a broken land use system, not a broken housing system. And so if you look at the issues related to debates between any number of jurisdictions about whether they're gonna develop commercial and or residential or just commercial and how we handle job growth, I'm just not sure how this fits into our broader discussion. And so I'm struggling because I don't know whether the goal is 250,000 units a year or 5 million units over 10 years because I don't know if this group has any thoughts at all about whether we should be a region of 20 billion people or, or, or 7 million. And so and whether the job growth has any relationship to the rest of this. So I, that's, I'm really struggling because I cannot get my head around the rest of this without understanding the, the scale and how we're proposing to related to this other issue. I think it's an excellent point and um, when we need to take up. I, I think what the only thing Derek reminded me of is as we're going through these, don't just tell us about the problems we missed or about problems. Lay out what you think we could do because what you have here is the intellectual capital of like 40 individuals in this group and it may be that we just didn't think of something. But if you have an idea, let us know. And you're right, other states do whole better different land use regimes, and maybe land use regimes and job housing balance as a state or a region needs to be on the list, and it isn't. So, uh, so in that spirit, I will just say, I think under your tax funding reform, I think it would be helpful if where you say, I'm just using your words back to these, make housing the most popular item, that needs to be somehow thought through in a way that says, ensure housing and job balance, and whether that occurs at the jurisdictional level, which I think is highly unlikely or appropriate, or at the county or at the regional, but someplace we need to articulate how our tax incentives and all these other things are gonna accomplish that. Okay, great. I'm gonna keep moving back to the original bucket because I'm great. mindful that we have less than half an hour. Is that okay? Can we, yes, Andreas. Uh, <clears throat> just to follow up on our conversation earlier, I do think that the labor supply issue needs a separate bucket. It's not on here. Um, and another comment I have too, that I don't know if I've got a solution, but I think the, the one challenge that we have with lots of projects, especially higher density projects, um, in a lot of communities is the NIMBYism factor. Uh, I don't know how many times we there's been projects that are being built union, affordable housing, high density, good for transportation, all of that. And there is that not my backyard syndrome. And so you know, what are the kind of solutions can we look at more stronger regionalization of the entitlement process? Okay, let's hold that and we get to streamlining and, and maybe we oh. need another category. So let's just hold that thought. So I'm gonna go now I'm gonna dive into the weeds. I'm sorry. Okay, so let's dive into the weeds because we have you know, I want to make sure we get time to talk about these. So the first big bucket is more and more variety of homes in every neighborhood in every city. And then in this category, most of these ideas, what I want to know now in this discussion is do you agree that the ideas that aren't highlighted in red and italics are basically good ideas? 
and should show up in some final work product of CASA, whether that's bills or a plan or something. Um, we don't debate the merits of the idea per se, although, and if, if we do, great, let's, let's daylight those. So I'm gonna walk quickly through the ideas and then and we'll talk about the one where we know we need some more time. Um, and then you're gonna tell me, yeah, those all sound like good ideas, kind of like Doug said, but you're missing X, Y, or Z, or no, I have a problem with that. Okay? All so, right. um, Denise? Yeah. Um, <laughs> on the one hand, I appreciate where you are going. On the other hand, that does not align with what we agreed to what this was gonna be. And let me say what I mean by that. We, had a dis we were in the middle of a discussion around what we thought the elements of a grand bargain could be. And I think it is difficult to say whether or not these things in red are things that I, at least for me, that I can agree to without knowing first what the elements are that I think are a grand bargain. Fair so enough. I don't... I don't know how to, I, you know, I, I look to the co-chairs to provide us with direction. The best we can do in the working group is to put our ideas down on a piece of paper and share them and get reactions and as to how that fits into a grand bargain, I, I think we need to work that through. And I agree people don't want to agree until they understand what the grand bargain is. And so folks are just going to have to decide if they want to share their concerns or not. I don't know how else we move past this moment. Let me suggest one. Um, you know, there were a few things that I was hearing before kind of going into this part of the conversation that seemed like potential elements of a grand bargain, and let me just play them back. Um, the grand bargain should increase production at every level. The grand bargain should increase or strengthen protection of the most vulnerable. The grand bargain should not sacrifice the most vulnerable in, in the name of facilitating more production. The grand bargain should have both benefits and incentives as well as penalties for jurisdictions that aren't building. The grand bargain should have no less uh, or should not lose affordable housing stock. The grand bargain should take into consideration labor issues. So I mean, to me, there are things that we put out here that I think need to be discussed before we start to say whether the red stuff is right for us or not. I'm okay with that. I just thought that we were here to report back to you on things we thought were good ideas and things where we need more time. And so that's what I was trying to do. People can, I don't know how else to have the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would just say, um, I'm not trying to be antagonistic. I also walked into this process thinking it would be messy. And I think we are entering the messy part. And, and I just, I want to just comment that, that I think the challenge is I don't know where we have the mess. Do we have it at the working groups? Do we have it here? I'm not clear. And so it's not, and this, this is the closest, frankly, friends. We, we've been to the mess, right? Like, we're actually having discussion. We got boards. And so it, Bill actually just said something that I think is true. It's hard to know what specifics you want to choose if you don't have the broader framework. And I think that's what you're both saying. And I would just advocate that we, maybe now, spend some time thinking about what the components, maybe from the post-its, are the grand bargain like what are we willing to work with because we the working groups need cri cri uh, parameters um, to understand I mean it's also part of the the grand bargain scale and impact right like so I don't know I feel like that's a piece that may need to come first and I advocate that maybe we use some of this time if that makes sense uh, um, I'm just a little confused so what Fred, what Fred just said, on balance, I probably agree with now, um, almost without exception. And, and maybe if that's what's missing, we should discuss it. But if it's not missing, we kind of have to get into the specifics, or else where do you go with it? Yeah, I, I, I say it differently. I, I, I assume that that was kind of everybody was nodding for what is a generic grand bargain structure. But the issues are, you know, which issues get bargained. And I think today's effort was to take the two, the two or three groups and get their issues on the table, talk about where the rubber meets the road, where the friction is, so that we have a sense of 
wow, this is never going to fly. Repealing Costa Hawkins is, is the poster child. You know, is that ever going to fly? Possibly not. Or adding 10 million high-rise condominiums, probably not. So there's some elements, I think, that are in here and how to do them. And the, the true record is how to do them, whether these are just goody ideas that you know, have been talked about in 500 other groups, or whether we can figure out a way to get the Metropolitan <coughs> Transportation Commission's uh, leverage to help motivate whoever we're trying to motivate to do these things. We don't have the power to do it. So we have to come up with a, this grand bargain idea was intended to be those elements to get his commission uh, in part to, to take them forward. So just to piggyback on what Fred and Phil were both saying, it, it, does it, anyone in here disagree with the grand bargain framework that Fred laid out? So let's make that our grand bargain framework. <coughs> And then let's have these weedy discussions in that context. Can I actually add? Um, I mean, Tamika said something I thought was really valuable as well, which is at what scale? So we can say, and I know we're going to go back and forth on this, Denise, because we've had this conversation leading up to the very moment we entered this room. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, how do I? How do we know we're hitting? an aim if we don't actually know what the scale of that aim is. So for example, you know, not talking about this spot, Scott, but like if we were able to make a pipeline for an additional 250 laborers to, you know, would that be sufficient as a goal or as an aim that we're coming to negotiate around? Or would we need to say, actually we want to try to hit that 10,000 gap, for example. You know, same with affordability level, that, or you know, funding for affordability, same with the number of tenants we protect. So I think part of the challenge, in the working groups at least, is what gets surfaced to this to brought, be brought to this table has in some ways to do with what's actually going to have any kind of, the kind of, le the level of impact that we are all seeking to achieve. Um, so again, the, I think Tamika said it, we are in the mess. <coughs> It's good. We needed to get here for a long time, and we're going to be in the mess probably for the rest of this process. So I'm embracing the mess. I'm happy to go with the wisdom of the group. A lot of hours were put into this list. If we can just honor the hours rather than changing the topic for the next 20 minutes, then at least we honor the work that was done, and we are free to pivot and do something else at any moment in time. I'm just trying to honor the work that was done in three meetings, each of which lasted at least two hours, each of which were attended by at least 20 people. Because I think it's important to share back that work product to the group if these working groups are working on behalf of the group. So yeah. can we, can we Doug, do that? Yeah, Doug, did you want to say something or did she cover it? Well, it's, I'm, unfortunately, it's not, it's, not, it's not on the same page as Denise, but I'm happy to hear it, Denise. I, I, I will say, I think that what really needs to be framed by the chairs before we pr proceed is, the scale is Plan Bay Area. That's the scale we're trying to work at. We have this expectation that we are not deviating from that number of homes, that number of commercial square footage, these number of jobs. We're trying to hit that. We're not trying to go beyond it. We're not trying to underhit it. Like just some clarity because the truth of the matter is if the thing is unbridled growth for growth's sake because we think that just building as much housing as the world can possibly fit onto a square mile is the solution to the Bay Area, then, then I'm not in the right conversation. And so, I, I mean, some of us are not just housing producers. We have kids. We get, believe in education. We care about open space. And I can't, I can't have a singular topic. I need you to, as a chair, to define the boundaries of the conversation, which I think was Linda's earlier conversation. I have no idea where we are in the bread box world peace <laughs> spectrum. And, and I think before you proceed to fairness to you, Denise, I'm happy to talk about this. I just need some clarity from Steve or somebody on that. Okay, and can I just ask a question? Because um, I do think production has done a lot of work, and I really respect how hard they're working to try to come up with ideas that we can all vet. And I feel like, um, like Doug said, I think we need some lens by which we judge these. I would also like for whoever is the note taker or creator um, to capture what Fred said that we could actually at least all agree on that at the next meeting, um, so, so that it's out there as a defining statement. But I also feel like, 
and I just come from accounting kind of a place, right? We always count, like, how many things are you going to do? I'm, you know, I've done a lot of work with Carl Bordino where he counts every single thing on the planet. Um, but, you know, how are we going to count our success? And if we know that, as I said, that Plan Bay Area is the boundary that we're looking at, what percentage of of that plan could we hit? Like, can we think about that? And, and uh, we were talking, Jennifer and I were talking about this earlier. On the tenant protection side, if we know that X number of tenants are being evicted annually and being displaced and ending up homeless, what percentage of that might we move the meter on with some of these policies? And I think we should all try to ask ourselves that question. And, and I don't actually know what the actual answer is to meaningful there, but I would be open to conversations with anybody in this room about how we get to that kind of a definition. So, you know, one new laborer for the carpenters union doesn't seem like enough new laborers to me. But, you know, between one and 225,000, where's the right number? So I, I would challenge us to think about that. So in the spirit of trying to kind of move us through this, um, let me make a suggestion. Um, you know, we had a, a meeting among some of the equity related folks uh, the other day, and there was a, a labor person in the room. So Andreas and Scott, you might be able to appreciate this. One of the ways that we, that we might want to try to move forward is through the concept of a tentative agreement, mm -hmm. where uh, you kind of think about um, what you are willing to agree to now with the acknowledgement among the group that until we kind of come up with those goals, come up with these broader statements, we don't have a total package and something that you tentatively agree to today, you may not agree to later on once we are clear about what those goals are uh, as well as uh, kind of what those values are that are the, the elements of a grand bargain. That, that could be a way to move forward. Can I give one uh, counter idea to the brilliance of, of this last conversation? And that is, when we did the ADU bill uh, through the Bay Area Council, we had no idea what we were going to accomplish. We knew there was maybe 300,000 possible sites, but we didn't have the goal of creating a number of ADUs. We had the goal of creating the legislation to allow the cities and impact the cities to provide ADU housing, which is now on a tear. I mean, the cities are now implementing it, they're now doing it, mostly because they have to, but they're, they're, a lot of them are doing it voluntarily. And so, while I'm, I'm always uh, prone to the wisdom of, of Fred and, and the group, that the goals are important, but the process and getting stuff done in a time frame that's in the center of the crisis, to me, has as much value as, as trying to get the precision of is it 200,000 workers or 20,000 workers? It's workers. So keep that in mind as we continue this process, which is the messy part. Uh, some of these things are going to be, I think, you know, just motherhood and apple pie to get them done. But we're going to have to convince legislators that it's the right thing to do. And, and the head count of what we expect, and I think 2040 is a good uh, blanket for this whole thing, just sort of as a, as a general target. But I'm just giving you the counter thought that the process of figuring out what we want to do is hard enough. How many we want to do is a second level of hard. And by when is the third level of hard and how quick. So all of those add up to a lot of hard. And uh, so we, we may be messy in that, but, but my suggestion is to try to get through some of these things um, with that in mind. Because there ain't going to be a grand bargain until it's all on the table. I think everybody knows that. I, I did want to respond to Doug because I'd like to, him to come to the next meeting. Um, I, I do think Plan Bay Area is a good enough envelope. Uh, now, look, uh, that plan talks about building, I think, a little over 800,000 housing units over the next couple of decades, um, which is at the rate we were doing in the 80s, not what we're doing now. We're doing about half that now. Uh, now, I also want to say that that plan produces some equity outcomes that I don't think anybody here likes. Um, now, it's better than if we didn't do the plan, uh, but it's not where we want to be. So I would probably say Plan Bay Area as modified uh, by the grand bargain is what we ought to shoot for. But I think a regional scale, a couple of decades scale, and something along that rate is what we ought to be shooting at. If you want to do better, be my guest. <laughs>
Well, we've got five minutes left, so we're not going to make it through this list. <laughs> um, but I think it's a good discussion, and one we have to have. So I'm all in favor of finding the mess and doing our best to work it through. And what I'd like to do is just tell you what the issues are in the production group that have been highlighted as things that need further discussion, so you know what we plan to work on next year. And then you know we'll find time to report back to the larger group on the details. Also. Please, if you have comments or thoughts or things that are missing, get back to me in writing um, so at least I hear your thoughts. I don't want to continue to have meetings in the production group without the benefit of the input of people who are in this room who are not in that room. So I had hoped to do that today. It's okay that we didn't, but I still want to hear from you. So please, please, please let me know what you think about what's on this piece of paper. Before we do that, Amy, I'm just going to wrap this up. Here are the things that we daylighted as needing further discussion in the production group. I just want to finish these thoughts and then we're out of time. The whole topic of inclusionary zoning, land value recapture as a philosophy in the housing market, um, housing impact fees as a source of funding, affordable housing, is something we need to discuss. The, from the market rate perspective, the more social goods housing is required to pay for and deliver, the less housing will be delivered at a less cost-effective point. So at some point, we ask so much of housing that we tank the housing market or we slow the rate of production or we turn viable housing sites into non-viable housing sites. Um, and, and we've reached that point in many Bay Area communities. So, and there's, on the other hand, some people think that it shouldn't be allowed at all if it doesn't hit certain social equity targets or certain affordability targets. Um, and so we need to have a more robust conversation about that topic. Um, and that relates to impact fees, community benefits, inclusionary zoning, and so forth. A related topic to that is that perhaps since the Palmer Fix bill did pass, there are ways of providing incentives to get developers to be able to achieve the on-site affordability goals expressed in the inclusionary zoning policy. So what could those incentives be that would help developers do what we want them to do, like uh, tax relief on the affordable units or density bonuses for inclusionary projects, which is somewhat ambiguous currently, are there other things that can be done so developers build the kind of housing that people want to see built? So a way of, of bridging the gap in the policies and by virtue of the fact that everyone in this room is talking about it, frankly. Um, another elephant that's walking into the room shortly, another messy one, is CEQA. Um, there, CEQA per, both creates litigation at the end of the process, but it also forces developers to give away the store to the NIMBYs day one when the, the project hits the boards. So you're always giving things away to make people not sue you under CEQA, and it becomes a whole game and an industry that makes it hard for developers and to move. Okay, two minutes. So that's one we have done now. Um, we need more, we've talked about tax funding reform. We actually think we need a tax consultant to help us with that, because <coughs> it's way beyond many of us, um, and we need to focus in on more money for affordable housing as well as labor policy discussions has, has broken brought today and maybe the broken land use system. There are many more ideas in here. Um, they're in writing. It's shorthand, so you may not understand it, but, but please let me know you have my contact information and I'll do my best to wrap in additional ideas into the next working group. So by the end of the month, we're going to list uh, sort of how we plan to slow down this work group and take some of these issues up. Um, and so we'll be getting out a schedule of when these topics are going to be coming. And then I just want to acknowledge, like, thank you for the messiness of this. And I think we're committed to figure out how to do this sort of bigger picture discussion and fit in the smaller things with that appropriately. But yeah, we didn't, we didn't really know how to have this discussion. So I want to acknowledge it. What's going to happen with the must-haves and the big goals? Uh, we are going to get the audio and we're going to capture Fred's thoughts that everybody nodded to and we'll put those on paper and we'll also put all of this on paper and we'll create a big messy list. Uh, and I think what I'm, Fred and Leslie are actually going to do right now, Amy, is 
actually try and talk about where we go in January. So we want to defer the rest of that question to them. Cool. Um, so I'll, I'll summarize by answering part of your question. I think that the must-haves and the big goals are an important part of the, the next step. And I think that our ability to get there um, will hinge on a few things. One is um, this work by the production group is fabulous work. And I think what we need is a similar kind of ledger for protection uh, and preservation. And so I think in terms of next steps, what we really need is to get to this level of detail and specificity <coughs> and red lines around where we think the messiness is for each one of these things. I think that that also has to be merged with the conversation about must-haves, big goals, and elements of the grand bargain like the ones that I was uh, kind of throwing out as a uh, straw person. So in my mind, what I would hope that we do in January is both take stock of these legends and hopefully by then we have three of them that have this level of detail and to be able to look at the red lines across all three and judge them against what our collective impression is of the must-haves and the big goals and the elements of the grand bargain. I think the combination of that in January actually puts us on a pretty good timeline uh, in terms of kind of how we get to the grand bargain that we, I think, all envision when we walk into the world. And if I could offer a friendly add on to that, I think what I hear the technical committee asking of you, the co-chairs, uh, is what are the boundaries of our work, and Steve has proposed Plan Bay Area, but uh, also acknowledging that it's short in a couple of areas, so I think that's an ask of you, you three. I, I think we could accept that. Well. Okay. <laughs> Can I make one quick suggestion, just as the working groups continue to work together, is on these long lists, I think one of the things, the values that CASA could provide is not taking on some of these, but giving a blessing that they're good ideas, that, and especially those that just, not just, but just require money. Like it doesn't require political will, it requires funding research, it requires getting a consultant, it requires funding a pilot. And because I think there are a lot of philanthropies out there who don't know how to act on this really complicated issue. And so having a CASA blessed list of prioritized actions that require funding, I think would be a way to have CASA get some of those, you know, get some of those hits, but not have to actually do them themselves. And then that way this group can focus on the ones that really create, really require political will and, and a grand bargain. I would just also ask that um, as we evaluate the big goals and um, the must-haves, that we have the, our research partners look at feasibility. I mean, I mean you know, uh, Denise talked about having a task consultant. I, I know that there's some ideas that, we, that I personally love, but in reality have all sorts of challenges. So I think to the extent that that's an overlay of what you described, Fred, I think would be helpful. Same vein, I guess, Steve, I'm, I'm, I apologize if I should know this and I don't about Plain Bay Area, but you, you know that there were things that were really good about it, the scale of it is defined in some certain way, but I think the extent that there's a, a set of reasonably consensus-oriented um, shortcomings of the plan that, that would help the various working groups understand what they're trying to solve for on top of just additional housing production, I think that would help orient us if we had 10 you know, drivers or seven or whatever, maybe not drivers, but just things that we are trying to hit, whether it's 500,000 homes preserved or whatever it is that you or an economist has reviewed the plan Bay Area and said this is what the, the, un, the, un, the anyway, the, 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 the negative aspects of the plan that we all probably would agree we want to address. I think that would be a helpful framing device because I hear Denise and I understand the frustration and I apologize for my part in it, but I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm just trying to figure out like how to your to the group's question like how do we know whether ideas are acceptable I think part of it is trying to figure out is it hitting one of these 10 markers like 800,000 units produced or 50,000 homes preserved or whatever it would be helpful if we were all on the same page at least to, to Fred's point like maybe it's tentative maybe maybe we're all not totally in agreement on them 
but we've at least thrown them out there, and so we're all kind of manipulating the same the same metrics. <clears throat> Doug, I, I, you know, the good news is the plan has a series of performance indicators uh, and an assessment of how well the plan is coping with them. Um, so that's something we can make available to the committee. I will say in general terms, if you want to think about it in the framework of the three E's of sustainability, you know, the economy, we're not doing too bad right now, right? Environmental protection, this region has led the nation and the world uh, for a long time on that. It's the third E uh, with respect to equity, displacement, cost of living, cost of travel. Uh, that's the place where we're really falling short. This, this is probably a question of the chairs, but at what point do we get into deciding about implementation? So, you know, some things may be philanthropy, some things may be just infeasible, or some things may need political will, but I think if we don't start looking at that, either in the committees or the chairs, I think we're missing a, a major piece of it. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and also to Caitlin's point, if there are some, some easy wins, then we should be identifying those and moving with them and not waiting. So. so just on that note, we had identified a series of quick, easy wins that are on this list, which we just decided not to talk about <laughs> until we have everyone's list. So I'm okay with that as an outcome. I really am. But you guys need to give us clear direction. We gave you a short-term, high-impact list, and we kind of got nothing back. We had a meeting, great. Now we have another list, which we also aren't talking about. So it would be really helpful as a co-chair for you to give us a clear schedule with clear outcomes that we all share, because it's hard to work this hard and come to a meeting and be told you answered the wrong question. Yeah, so I, I just would like clarity on that for the sake of all the co-chairs, because we're all working really long hours at any weeks to try and do this. And it, it is hard and frustrating. And, and I feel a lot of support, but you guys need to give us more clarity. I think we've, we've heard that loud and clear today. And as, as Jennifer stated, uh, that will be what we will, will do in the next few weeks. And before we meet again, we'll have that information. Well, I'm glad we're at the mess. Um, so we're going to have the community outreach report uh, on your agenda at 110. The council for the NPC actually opinion will kick us off, uh, and then I'll just describe. Thank you. And actually, Tamika and I will, will both talk about this. So basically, through the meetings, we've been talking about how do we engage in a community engagement process that you know, to the, it's to the extent of it, the final purpose of it, when it should happen, all of that. So we've been talking to the MTC staff about a strategy and approach to this. And I think that, you know, the sense is that we want something that, um, particularly as we reach out to underserved communities, that makes clear this isn't vague entirely. We want to do it in the process early enough where they're not just being told what we're arriving at and given an opportunity to actually um, provide input and for that to be taken into account. Um, I think that one of the things that we asked MTC to take a look at is what had they done in the past that made sense and what worked for them and how might this be funded, which is in the report that um, is in your packet today in terms of the ultimate proposal. Um, before I turn it over to Tamika, just to add some of the comments that she made at, the, at our call that we had at Big Ground, I just want to say that I really think that it's important that our community engagement around this not just be focused on one part of our communities. The reality is this is planned for the Bay Area. That's a big population. And we really need to understand, at least from my perspective, that we use the information that's developed here and the proposals to really drive engagement and hopefully support. And we're not going to do that if we ignore the bulk of the population that may be homeowners and rental property owners and all sorts of, you know, the, the entire spectrum of people who are out there. So I will talk a little bit more about, you know, my sense of how we can do this in a better way or a more expanded way beyond just social media and relying on the website. But let me turn it over to Tamika right now to just go ahead and make the points you made on the call. Um, thanks. I would just add, um that, you know, like our sort of overarching goal of housing for everyone, it really is 
community engagement for everyone. I think we want to make sure that folks are not only um, aware of this process, but participating in this process. And that's why we wanted to get something um, that is parallel to the work we're doing. Uh, I think it's really disingenuous to start a process like this without having a parallel process that involves the broader Bay Area and our advocates and community members, residents, whomever, who uh, care about these issues the same way we do. They don't have the same language, they don't have the same accessibility, but they want to participate. So we wanted to figure out a way to introduce a process that would allow for that. We also um, wanted to get uh, folks buy in on the front end because implementation I think Rich talked about this in order for CASA's uh, work to be successful in my opinion we have to have a pretty robust community organizing strategy that's going to help get people on board with what we're trying to do and not the the same actors in the in the you know um, hope of diversifying this process and so I feel like this is not just a, a means of participation but it's also part of our strategy once we come up with that grand bargain to have a diversity of people who are going to be pushing that agenda and not just um, those of us who spend our day jobs and side hustles um, dealing with this work. So um, I'm really excited and I think we want to have an opportunity for input on this. So Vikram, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, so, this is the first draft. It's a proposal that we want to review and provide feedback on. Uh, as you already heard from the co-chairs, the you know, process is messy and we have to still figure out quite a few things. Uh, and that's basically uh, what we are factoring in uh, when we propose this timeline for outreach. So, absolutely we need to engage the broader community. We need to make an extra effort to get to the disadvantaged communities who are not typically always involved fully in these processes. Uh, but we also want to make, acknowledge a, a few different things, um, and they're laid out. And I think this is uh, worth having a conversation about. Um, the first one is that you know over the last I don't know uh, like at least five years that I've been here at NTC, we've done a lot of outreach on housing, housing affordability, displacement, um, and and to some extent we feel like we um, would want to go back to the community if we go back in, you know with. A message, the message would be we are trying to do something and here are some of the ideas that we've just discussed so far, rather than going back and asking again, what are your issues? So I think we completely agree that we need to do the outreach part, but I think we were hoping that by spring, there would be greater clarity on what the goals are, what the must-haves are, at least the messaging is a, is a little bit more um, cohesive and we've, we've agreed to what we are uh, at least asking people to provide input on, on how to engage. So the proposal that is in front of you has, I would say, three components. One is focused on the disadvantaged communities. One is um, you know, the broader outreach. Uh, and the third part is this statistically valid poll that we hope to have um, if we have the resources before we start the advocacy process for legislation at the state level or in other places. So, uh, you know, I'll just describe those uh, elements in, in that order. Uh, for Plan Bay Area, we did uh, a very similar effort where we gave out stipends to community-based organizations to uh, reach out to their constituents and engage them in a way that works uh, for the community members. So in, in language, cultural competency, all of it, uh, the CBOs are in a better position to reach out to their, um, their membership or the constituents that they represent um, than any consultant or you know, staff could possibly do at the regional level. So we hope to uh, provide similar stipends to uh, a few uh, CBOs and you know, Tamika and affiliate have volunteered to kind of help us identify which CBOs uh, we would engage with. We will come back to you with information and if you have any feedback, you want to connect us with any organizations, we would love to take feedback. Um, and you would then provide them stipends for two rounds of input. And again, this is just you know based on what information we have today in terms of you know the overall timeline for CASA. Uh, the first uh, outreach phase would be uh, you know, when we have the beginnings of, or at least some elements, components of the grand bargain kind of understood uh, by, the, uh, by the technical committee and the steering committee. So we, we think that would be the spring, um, and then you know, between spring and fall, we're hoping that you know, the, the grand bargain will come together, and there would be close to final package by fall, and fall would be the second time that we would then ask the CBOs to reach out um, 
to, uh, you know, at that point to get uh, specific input on the, uh, the entire package. Um, in addition to that, you know, the broader outreach, we were hoping that there, there would be, you know, within the broader outreach, there are two, two components. Uh, and one of them is that we have uh, you as the technical committee members uh, representing different uh, constituents yourself, and you were uh, you know, asked to serve on this committee because you do already serve as a leader in your um, various sectors or industries. So we, we do want to rely on you um, to do some broader outreach, to provide information, to engage um, you know, businesses, residents, organizations, entities that you interact with. Um, so you are a conduit to uh, some of that outreach as well. Uh, the part two of that outreach, again, is something that MTC staff can probably uh, work with the coaches on, and that is to have forums uh, around the region, uh, maybe in the spring, where we, again, have some more solidified uh, piece of information to share. Um, you know, at least, for example, like mayors could host these forums in the three big cities, and we could see if we could do additional meetings in the North Bay and in the Tri-Valley, but the idea again is that the uh, technical committee members and steering committee members uh, would be listening to information. So it's a listening session, we present what we have so far, and really it's an opportunity for all our stakeholders to come and provide input. Um, we, are, we are also uh, exploring some online platforms to get additional feedback, that's something that's still being discussed. Uh, but there is also information on the agency websites, and we do run some uh, you know, social media and newsletters and, and mailing lists, uh, we, which we can use to get the word out. Uh, and finally, the, the statistically valid polling. Again, we were hoping that by fall, when we do have the, um, you know, the, the kind of close to final package, that we could do that polling um, and there get feedback from the widest uh, set of. Uh, residents uh, in terms of their support for the entire package before we go to the, uh, the state for uh, you know, the funding ask or a legislative ask. Um, so that's kind of the outline of the, of the proposal. Um, we would love to get, get your feedback on that. Well, it sounds like it's on the right track. Anybody comments, thoughts, ads, tweets? So, um, as someone who does a lot of development work in the suburban parts of the, this region, um, what's the thought on how we're going to reach out to the schools, the superintendents, the, the folks who have, you know, at virtually every thing I've been to for the last year come and testify against anything new because we haven't created enough new schools? I, I mean, I feel like to Doug's comment earlier that this sort of what's the balance here, and I. I I appreciate the thoughtfulness of this, but I feel like there's some folks who could throw a huge monkey wrench into this, even beyond the grand bargain at this table, that we probably should give some thoughts, and I don't know how, how you're all thinking about that. <coughs> Excuse me, the Tamika's point about we really need to look at this also as kind of organizing. So to your point in groups that you know are to be identifying people ahead of time who we know we need to engage. And, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but, you know, it's like when I think about how many people go out to meetings, not very many. And we need to really think about how we've reached that group that's at home that have responded to polls who say housing is a big problem in this area and give them a voice and a way to be able to respond to help offset sort of the people who come to, you know, raise objections. And I do think that there are enough online platforms that are being used now very effectively around big planning issues that make people get engaged, that give them an opportunity to weigh in early to help shape. We really need to ramp that up because I don't think we can just count on, you know, in-person meetings. But part of, Linda, what we need to do is identify groups that we know we need to target in terms of the information that goes out in schools is probably one of them. Yeah, I would also just add that a you know, number of us serve on a whole bunch of other things that everybody in this group should sort of make a list of all the hats they wear and where there might be presentations, whether that's a local Rotary Club or the Innovation Tri Valley group, like whatever that group is, that you might be able to create the invitation for the presentation or be able to make a presentation that we should, as a group, be orchestrating what that list looks like. 
That would be good when we have a presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never helps to, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. Uh, I really appreciate the, the thoughtfulness in approaching the, oh, go ahead, Mary. Hi, sorry, Amy. Um, what elf in the room that we aren't allowed to talk about, I guess, or that isn't in our scope is the fact that we've already displaced a huge number of people out of the Bay Area entirely. And Steve, you, you touched on the fact that um, Plan Bay, you know, that the, the whole transit and commute issue is devastatingly bad. Are we going to be able, is, is any aspect of this going to be about creating transportation options? Because at some point, you know, plan by area, let's say it's 800,000 units. Okay, we, we all don't want to live in Manhattan. Thank you, Doug, for mentioning that. Um, you know, at what point are we going to be focusing also on facilitating, making it possible for people to get back and forth to jobs in the Bay Area, unless we're just going to flat out restrict job growth here? Well, you want to solve the transportation problem too? Well, it's the flip side of the housing <laughs> coin. They're, they're, they are bonded together, as you, they, as they you are know so well. Together. I, I, I do think the reason that a transportation agency can be this outfit, though, is that we acknowledge that where we haven't spent enough time or we haven't had enough success is in housing. That, that is not ignoring the fact that we've still got plenty of transportation issues to clean up, too. Yeah, as, as with other subjects, these conversations on transportation go on, you know, whether it's the Bay Area Council or the MTC, and try to come up with their versions of grand bargains to get the mega region, which we now refer to it as, getting people from the middle of the state or the north of the state or the south of the state to the jobs locations, as well as trying to get the jobs out in that direction. So Steve's right. That's a... That's a a whole other critical uh, element to this mix. Not probably in our purview, but yeah. So again, I want to thank the uh, everyone who worked on the outreach and engagement plan. Uh, the part that to me is concerning is that five thousand dollars to do this work at stipend. It just it we we the voices that need to come forward and and post fire sonoma and the voices in the heart of silicon valley and out in east contra costa and i mean there's like doing educators and workers and you know young people and it, people who've been displaced out to the central valley like there's so many people to to get perspective on this and to me maybe a different strategy is to do focus groups and to try and focus in on resources because to do broad outreach um, with only for organizations with a small stipend i'm just not sure we're going to cover the range of voices that we really need to cover and so it seems like either we set out up front here's here's who you know are we going to reach out to the many languages well five you know like I just I think we need either some, some some clear goals on this that could make this a reality, or to focus in a, in another way. Or are you thinking about doing some kind of a phone poll, social media? You just get a diff, you get you get some information there. But if you want to do the one on one, really getting more or groups. Um, so that would be my recommendation. And have you talked to any CBOs that? are in a position to do some of this some some are in the room and uh, you know they would be the likely folks to to go out and engage and i'm just not sure um, i would see this as being um, as realistic as maybe we would want it to be if, without more focus mm -hmm. or parameters and amy i just wanted to mention that we are as vikron described we are planning in the probably in the late summer fall uh, <coughs> timing is everything with this messy effort but going out with a poll um, we found that you know in a region of now approaching 8 million people, um, focus groups can be good, uh, outreach is helpful, but it's really, really difficult to get a really good uh, input into a regional process because we're so big. Um, and we've had real success and pretty different outcomes when we've had polls around certain issues than when we have you know, the folks who, who show up and, and speak. So that is one thing to keep in mind. So um, just speaking of uh, community outreach is probably time to do the, the, the 
Judge Cotton. It is. So we don't get too far off schedule, and uh, put those good comments in. So the first speaker is Lindsay, followed by Ken Pichowski. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Gattiuso. I'm here with Public Advocates in the Six Months for Social Equity Network. And I have two comments and two handouts today. Uh, first, I want to commend the committee for taking a step back to focus on goals and values and uh, really getting the big picture and focus. In particular, I want to say thank you to Tamika and Jennifer and Fred for really bringing out those questions in that conversation. Uh, to Tamika and Doug and Jennifer's and others' comments about scale, back in September we handed out a document that actually included three goals that get to this problem of scale. We worked with Miriam and a lot of other folks to really hone in on those goals. And I want to, uh, I'm going to hand those back out to y'all. And I really want to encourage you to agendize time, to the, for the co-chairs to agendize time to talk about goals in January. At the steering committee meeting back in September, multiple steering committee members discussed the need for order of magnitude solutions, but we still don't have a clear picture here about what that order of magnitude solution is. Well, there's, no, there's no agreement here. And considering the fact that both steering committee and the technical committee are meeting in January, the steering committee for the second time, I think it's important to really agendize additional time for that discussion. Second, uh, as it was highlighted here and over the past couple months as the work groups have gotten up and running, and now we're going to start to discuss policy solutions, there's a lot of uh, voicing of confusion about what we are all working towards at the end of this process. And everyone around this table and everyone around the room and a lot of folks who are not here are putting in a tremendous amount of time into this process. And so to Fred's discussion about the Grand Mar Bar Grand now that all these policy solutions are sort of on the table, I would really encourage the co-chairs to agendize time to talk about what is meant by a grand bargain. And it's really difficult to get into the weeds and negotiate on specific policies when you don't know what you're negotiating towards. And it is CASA aiming to produce three separate housing packages focused on the state, regional, and local levels that CASA participants advance together? Uh, is it just one package of solutions focused on one of those levels? Is there a contract between all the parties at this table and additional parties beyond this? And what does a grand bargain look like at the end of all this? And what is everyone sitting around this room investing so much time and working towards? And we have put together some initial thoughts on what that could look like and would really encourage the co-chairs to agendize time for both of those topics in January. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I just have a few comments. Uh, I think one of the things that's really missing here is trying to convince the elected officials. I mean, if you go out and convince the community or something, they have to convince the convince the local elected officials. What are cities doing wrong to uh, stop the production of housing? Can we identify the issues in each city that are a problem so we can convince those elected officials to change their opinion? We have to convince the elected officials because they're making the decisions. You're not going to have any housing unless you convince those folks. So somehow they've got to be informed of what you're doing and maybe uh, solicit their opinion. Do a poll of the elected officials and see what you get. Because otherwise you're not going to be able to implement anything and you'd be wasting your time. I mean, how can you help them do the job? How can you even convince them it's necessary? Should, should the planning commission require two bedroom units with every project? Or should they require extensive design review which makes it cost ineffective? What are we doing with the utility districts? They charge so much for water hookups in East Bay, 10 times more than San Francisco. I think that's an issue that needs to be looked at. Thank you. So next up is Heather, followed by Michelle, followed by Zelda. Hello, my name is Heather Brownfield. I represent the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. Um, I am here to talk about the um, opportunity maps that we have been helping to generate with um, the partnership of other organizations that are seated at this table. So this is part of the California Fair Housing Task Force, um, which was convened by uh, the Tax Credit Allocation Committee and uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, this year. Um, right now in Sacramento, they are hopefully adopting officially these maps as part of the new regulations for the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And they were, they were, they were created with the intention of being used at multiple levels of government. Um, and the reason I bring them up now is because of the production conversation, what I didn't see on the list of items is where we're actually talking about producing more housing. You know, we said in every single neighborhood, but if we keep the status quo as it is, we're going to just put all of these truly low income and low income housing in the you know, East Oakland or in you know, South Central Richmond. Um, and I don't think this is something that everyone, you know, this is not something that we would find acceptable at this table. Um, so 
you know, endorsing the maps officially or taking them into consideration as part of the production goals, creating more incentives for cities to produce their you know, low-income um, housing in areas of opportunity. These are all things that um, you know can be considered by folks at the table. Um, so yeah, thank you. Hi, Michelle Majid from Urban Habitat and the Six uh, Winds for Social Equity Network. So similarly, I want to start off by acknowledging and agreeing um, with what we've heard from a lot of folks today uh, around value-based visioning and goal setting to determine the elements of a grand bargain. And as Lindsay mentioned, we have um, enumerated and made really clear what these goals could be. So we hope that you will revisit them. Um, there was also a comment that Fred made that not uh, that not all neighborhoods are created equally because of historic and ongoing patterns of racial exclusion and so it would be incredibly helpful to develop typologies and connect and connecting them to the appropriate anti-displacement policies under the three P's approach. Uh, we also want to thank you. Uh, we're excited to see a real community engagement strategy. This should be very commonsensical and I'm disappointed that it wasn't uh, set off from the start on the uh, agenda for the meeting today and up for discussion today. CASA Solutions will require community buy-in and political momentum to implement. Starting to develop relationships and buy-in early in the process will help create faster and smoother implementation. Um, it's great to see that uh, there's an approach to identify the needs in different geographic areas, um, especially focus on engaging communities traditionally represented in government decision making, but hugely impacted by said decisions, investments, and disinvestments. Um, there are many local community partners throughout the region who are on the edge of addressing the current displacement crisis, a number of whom came to MTC's Housing Displacement Forum in 2016. We hope they'll be invited to lead these meetings, and we look forward to discussions and collaboration moving forward. Lastly, these community meetings should be a space for all participants to brainstorm and ground truth solutions that speak back to the bigger CASA process in order to build a robust and equitable regional housing agenda. Uh, the forum should invite residents to share their thoughts, understand regional demographics and housing trends through data, vote on key policy strategies, and talk through implementation at the local, regional, and state levels. Um, and agree with Amy that $5,000 is not adequate. So we hope that can be bumped up. Zelda, followed by Steve Levy, who's the last speaker. I'm on first name basis here, but for some of you who don't know me, my name is Zelda Bronstein. I'm a journalist who writes about land use, political economy in the Bay Area and beyond. I'm also a former chair of the Berkeley Planning Commission. And this thing's gonna fall out. Okay. I have a suggestion, a really easy suggestion. Not exactly outreach, it's transparency. There are no minutes attached to the agendas of these meetings. I asked Ken Kirkey and Jennifer Lassar at the end of October why not. I did not get a reply. I understand that you're not legally required to have minutes, but for a public agency to conduct a process which has such ambitious goals without letting the public know what's going on in the meetings, unacceptable. Look at the Granicus page of MTC's website, as I did once again yesterday. CASA's not even listed there. Under its meetings, there's no, there are no videos, thanks to Ken Bukowski, there is a video available. MTC should be taping these meetings. I called staff, I'm a journalist, discovered there's an audio tape. It's not posted. It needs to be posted. On a larger scale or longer term look, this is again a public agency. It is being in this program, it's being convened by MTC. It is being supported by taxpayer dollars. It is inappropriate I'm speaking now to the um, representatives from the Turner, the representative from the Turner Center, to see this is only reaching out to people who might agree with the policies that are going to be recommended here. Everybody needs to know about them. And what really ought to happen is that these policies ought to be vetted at the city council of every city in this region, not just the cities, the three big cities. It's been quite apparent for some time that the big three in this region do not share all the priorities with the smaller and medium-sized jurisdictions. It's undemocratic, inappropriate, and just downright wrong to see this as an organizing, a mobilization effort to support this. Maybe it's going to be good, maybe it's not. 
There are a lot of things that are printed in black here, which are very controversial in this region. Maybe not in the production working group, but among many people in the Bay Area. They ought to be vetted, and not just in the late spring or fall or summer or wherever. Now, or at least starting in 2018, as early as possible. Thank you. A couple of weeks after that, I went to two of the on-the-table meetings with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. I had written a paper with Emma Emmett that started that. Last week, I went to a meeting with 40 legislators talking about housing in California. Yesterday, I went with Michael to the Bay Area Council Economic Institute to talk about their housing affordability study. So I have heard all of the hot button issues from various perspectives. But two things that I heard in all those meetings were much, much, much more important. <coughs> and that is, opposed to a grand bargain, it sounds like people with disparate views grudgingly agreeing to a set of things, some from table A, some from table B, I heard massive common agreement in many of the buckets that Denise and Michael talked about, reducing cost, um, reducing barriers about delay, getting more money for affordable housing, changing the fiscal incentives. And I've got to say that the grand bargain piece to me, I know you don't mean it, Fred and others, but it feels like Congress, if you don't agree with me, I'm going to pick up my marbles and go home. Wouldn't it be wonderful if maybe you didn't resolve all of the hot button issues, but you had massive move the needle areas of agreement that you could put out there, whether or not or however you agreed with the hot button issues? It sounds like this is focused more on getting to agreement on the sticky stuff than in putting out the stuff that moves the needle. The second thing that I heard in Denise, it's the one thing that's confirmed but it didn't jump out. Every place I went, they talked about public lands. You've got an item here. They talked about teacher housing. They talked about missing middle housing. Not condos that I like you live in, not subsidized units like we all want but all of those massive people in the middle who struggle with affordability almost as much as people who are poor. So um, it's inferred in your list, Denise, but I think that's, I think teacher housing is an area that everybody could agree on and get behind and Steve and MPC and all of you could have something specific. Um, and it wouldn't touch all the hot issues. so thanks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so, speaking of housing initiatives, Ken's going to give us an update on NPCs and where we are on some of those things. Thank you. Um, so, I'm just going to kick things off. There's already been some discussion today in other meetings about Plan Bureau 2040 and what it said. Um, the plan was different than prior plans, in part because running up to the plan adoption, I think our policymakers heard about the housing crisis in every single meeting, even if the item had nothing to do directly with housing. Um, also, as Steve suggested, we did a performance assessment or performance analysis of how the plan would perform over time and look at e equity. The housing and transportation costs for households in the Bay Area over time got worse and worse and worse. Essentially, if we stay the course with where we are, the levels of subsidy we have, the type of housing we're building, the general lack of housing being built, and on and on that you all know about, uh, the general prognosis is that with every economic cycle, things will just get worse. And we'll be in even worse shape than we will be going forward. So that led to the creation of something called an action plan. Uh, that was adopted by both the commission and the executive board 
It called for the convening of this effort um, as a vehicle to try to create a grand bargain or something like that uh, to really move the needle and bring disparate interests together. It also called for advancing, I guess, what would be some singles, uh, to use a baseball analogy, of some relatively small programs that we already have underway. Um, because we're short on time, I'll just use one of the examples. We have a preservation pilot fund uh, that MPC is putting $10 million into. We're looking to leverage that money five to one with other sources. It's essentially to look at the issue of preserving housing in the region that is currently affordable to low-income households or very low-income households, de-restricting it over time, and seeing if that's not something where we might be able to really get um, some traction going forward and maybe move from pilot to a larger funding source. We were also uh, directed, as has been discussed at these meetings to date, to look at the issue of conditioning transportation funding for housing outcomes. That's an issue we'll be coming back to the committee on this spring and the summer. Uh, the commission took an action uh, last month uh, directing staff to essentially look at all manner of transportation funding and consider how we might be able to do that. And in addition to that effort, there are some specific efforts. I'm not going to give you a lot of detail. The Crown will give you a little bit more. But there's some specific initiatives that have already been discussed, perhaps not with the same name um, or the same terminology, but have been discussed in the work groups to date. Uh, one is to consider what would a Bay Area Regional Housing Trust Fund look like. Um, given the jobs housing disconnect in this region, what if there were a regional jobs housing linkage fee? That, that's a third rail if it's not constructed the right way. But doing analysis on something that might actually fly and create funding for affordable housing. Another area of research will be opportunity areas. Um, think office parks, shopping malls, the suburban big footprint uh, land uses in the Bay Area, um, some of which are moving forward uh, in real time to be transformed into mixed income neighborhoods. Hats off to Leslie and SB at Home for their work uh, pushing Mountain View North Bayshore over the line last night where there will be 10,000 new homes. It's kind of a poster child for that effort. It was actually this morning. This morning? Yes. Even better. Um, and so there's a whole series of other items which Bikron can get into, but our goal is to start connecting the dots with this work, with the work that the work groups are doing, and to try to cross-fertilize cross these actions that the commission and executive board directed staff to do so we can really try to get some traction. So with that, Bikron. Thanks, uh, Ken. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll keep this brief, but I think Ken, you will keep uh, available quite a few of these initiatives. Uh, we have in your packet uh, the uh, uh, parts of the action plan that uh, Ken re referenced uh, under 2040, <coughs> the, plan, uh, the housing section, so you can uh, take a look at that. It has a little bit more detail on what the commission approved. Uh, what we have up here on the slides are some of the initiatives uh, that come out of either the action plan or were already underway. Uh, that NPC is working on. And I'll just be very brief on all of them. So uh, just, I think today morning, uh, the TOA 2.0 was approved with, uh, yeah. anyway. We are um, rebranding uh, or repurposing the TOA fund to be more simpler and more effective in terms of getting money out for affordable housing that's underway. Uh, Ken mentioned the Bay Area Preservation Pilot, which was formerly known as NOAA. Uh, the Regional Invest, uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, again, a way for uh, the regional agency to help fund some of the infrastructure needs for infill housing, close to transit. Uh, the Jumpstart Program, 80K by 2020 Challenge. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, again, programs that either provide technical assistance, incentives, or some form of requirement that would encourage, coax, uh, push our local jurisdictions uh, and other stakeholders involved. Um, to build, permit more housing at all income levels. I think all of the things that we have talked about so far. Um, so with that, I think uh, we will um, get into a, a more detailed discussion on the public land study, um, which Therese will pick up. Good afternoon, Therese Trevetti with the uh, staff for MTC ABA Regional Planning Program. And just to briefly introduce this item, I think you've heard public lands mentioned uh, a couple of different times in the last two speakers. 
Um, MTC has been looking at assessing public lands as a way related to the conditioning of transportation funding, particularly looking at underutilized public lands near transit. And that's really essentially what this study was about, to just really evaluate, dig in, and try to understand what the opportunities were. <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna, <coughs> excuse me, introduce you to Darren Smith from Economic and Planning Systems. Uh, he was part of the team that did this evaluation. So take it away, Darren. Good afternoon, again, Darren Smith with EPS. Uh, the project started really about two years ago, um, and in that time, we've been working with a, an urban design firm, community design and architecture, to uh, identify sites throughout the Bay Area, eight different counties of the Bay Area. Um, San Francisco was not included so far, but is going to be. Uh, San Francisco was doing their own study and partnership at the time, but we're going to be folding that in in the, in the coming months. Um, so the intention of it was to identify how many sites uh, meet certain criteria. They're large enough, they're within uh, half a mile of transit, they have good dimensions, they are uh, near certain amenities that make them competitive for uh, TCAC and, and uh, cap and trade funds and so forth. Uh, and then looking at each of them to try to identify what types of housing might physically fit there and be financially viable on those sites. We looked at about eight different uh, housing prototypes ranging in densities and parking solutions and so forth. And then finally recommending some next steps for uh, those agencies that own land as well as for MTC uh, that are really focused very much on the idea of getting these public lands into circulation and development for housing, uh, both affordable and workforce housing. Uh, so here's just one example. This is a site in San Jose. Um, 1.4 acres owned by the uh, Redevelopment Agency, uh, where we looked at a couple different prototypes for development and uh, you know, came up with a, uh, a recommended type that might work on this one. Um, and we did this for every transit sta station, every major transit station uh, in the eight counties. Uh, ultimately, we came up with a total of about 415 sites uh, throughout the eight counties. Uh, summing to 362 acres, um, and this chart shows the, the top 10 agency owners. Uh, BART has 34 sites, summing to 57 acres. Again, that's not all of the land that they control or all of the land that any of these agencies control, but these are the ones that met all the criteria we put forth, uh, particularly those with respect to their proximity to schools and parks and grocery stores and healthcare facilities and such that would make them most competitive for um, uh, higher level funding sources. So BART is our number one uh, landowner, and again, they have much more than this, um, but these are the uh, kind of the cream of the crop sites that we've identified. So other uh, findings from our work included the fact that uh, you know, we looked at the pro formas for these types of development and found, not surprisingly, that really any kind of affordable or workforce housing, even, even moderate income housing, is really requiring some form of subsidy at this point. The development costs are uh, exceeding the values of those units, and so they require some form of funding. Uh, some of them will qualify for federal or state uh, programs. Others really need a local funding source. And the public land can be a major source of that uh, subsidy. It can, you, it, to the extent that you can write down the value and use it as leverage as a local match, uh, that can be a very strong contributor to making these projects pass. So the action plan that we put together, we've been working with a technical advisory group comprised of uh, housing developers and cities and agencies, uh, and there's still some more work to, do, to be done on that. We have a draft of the action plan. It is really about uh, recommending actions for those agencies and for MTC to put these lands into circulation for housing development. Uh, the action plan includes some market data just to kind of set the context, but really it's about what can be done, what is the menu of things that uh, local agencies, cities, uh, transit agencies, any kind of landowner can take on uh, to, again, advance the ball on uh, development of housing. And ultimately, we have uh, a series of recommendations for MTC's action, one of which is to continue to link the funding of infrastructure with housing production. Um, as was mentioned earlier, there are a number of different programs in place already. Um, 
the funding for those is nice, but uh, clearly inadequate for the scale of development opportunity that we're talking about. So any uh, opportunity to increase that funding um, would be very much recommended. Uh, funding project infrastructure, one of our findings, of course, is that for transit agencies or any other agency that owns land, uh, one of the major constraints is replacement parking costs. And we know that we want to minimize parking to the extent that that's practicable, but it's not always practicable. And that is one area in which MTC may play a direct role uh, in terms of funding the infrastructure that really facilitates the rest of the development. Supporting technical assistance for property disposition is another recommendation. Uh, MTC has planning grants and technical assistance grants uh, for agencies and communities. Um, not every agency has their own staff who is well versed in, in offering sites for development. So to the extent that MTC can support uh, that kind of action through technical assistance funding, that is recommended. Uh, it was already mentioned that a regional infrastructure fund is being considered already, uh, creating a regional land bank where the various agencies might be able to pool their land resources and make efficient use of a collective staff um, and other resources to make that happen could be recommended as well. And finally, we have a couple of ideas that uh, might be advanced for legislative change, particularly uh, causing agencies to have to identify surplus lands. There is already the surplus land requirements that uh, any publicly owned land um, be offered to affordable housing developers, but there is not a requirement that the agencies identify that land in the first place. So that's one of the examples of legislative action that MTC might, might get behind uh, to make these types of uh, projects more viable and more uh, supported at the state level. So I just uh, wanted to close by saying uh, the study will be finishing up uh, the, in the early part of next year after we do the San Francisco work. And the reason that we brought it to your attention is that many of the things, as you see here, are things that have been discussed with CASA, or this work might support some of the recommendations that come out of CASA going forward. So that, um, that concludes our presentation for today. I did have a couple questions, sure. um, just in the reality of, of surplus land. So did, uh, did your study also look at zoning? Our study did look at zoning. Um, that was among the, the various factors. Of course, we also looked at what the existing con conditions on those sites were. Right? And, and school districts own a lot of land, but most of them are used for schools, so we ignored that. Um, but we looked at zoning um, as one of the contributing factors toward the viability of development. Okay, yeah, because in both San Jose and Santa Clara, most of the, the available surplus land is zoned for um, for commercial, industrial, other uses other than residential, and they're pretty strong about what they'll do in that. Um, also, what we found is that on the cost savings, that these uh, most of the jurisdictions are not interested in selling uh, at the low market rate, so it's a little bit challenging on that. Um, and then um, the, you know, the other piece, which maybe is a little bit harder, is the idea of underutilized land, but there's a lot of of land that's actually not surplus, but it's underutilized, that, that I think um, is uh, important as well. Um, and maybe lastly, uh, just to mention that uh, making state land easier to access would be really important because the state process, uh, one parcel that we did in San Jose, uh, took seven years um, to, to be able to acquire and the state was willing um, so it's just the process is tough. So I'd say as a legislative uh, uh, idea, that would be one. And I think there are folks in Sacramento interested, uh, legislators interested in that. Just a question about the state lens to follow up on Leslie is, um, you know, some of these are not within half a mile of transit, but they, in my world view, represent fairly significant opportunities. But the Cal State and the UC systems are significant owners of land. And we may need to bring transportation to them, or they may need to create shuttles, but it feels like there hasn't been enough of a push on, on that. So 42 acres actually feels like an understatement to me, uh, particularly when you think about under underutilized. You know, the DMVs are out there in a lot of single-story configurations. And let's face it, we're all going to not need licenses soon because of driverless cars. So, so where are we thinking about? Um, those kinds of state-owned opportunities that can be reused opportunities, because I think there's a lot more of them than sort of 42 acres worth. That, 
I would also say that the VTA 29 acres sounds wrong because even their headquarters is probably 12 acres. And so they've got a lot of big sites and they're, I think those are some of the most viable even though we do have some zoning issues there. Um, I just had a comment about um, the fact that many jurisdictions are actually looking at their own public lands policy and to the extent that we've been having conversations in this meeting today about a micro and macro approach of how what you all are doing at the NTC regional level actually helps cities either advance or be informed by what they should be considering in their public lands policies. Oakland is a great example. It's underway right now. I see that they're a part of this study. So to the extent that these recommendations or what you find um, can inform the local policies as well and potentially give decision makers or other stakeholders um, cover or support to advance some of the goals would be helpful. I just want to highlight, and we'll send this through to um, Jennifer Lassar to distribute it out to everyone as part of the process, but the Great Communities Collaborative has had a working group that has been working and focusing for a long time on um, prioritizing publicly owned lands as a critical resource for affordable housing. It was NPH's legislation back in 2014, 2015 that went forward that we've identified a lot of these challenges around implementation where we need to go back for some legislative fixes. But in, to the extent that um, there's there's a lot of great stuff in this very, very brief report that highlights uh, what we can do as CASA or what MTC can do as CASA, recommendations around prioritizing publicly owned lands for affordable housing. So I want to make this available to people, but also to send it through the process. So stay tuned. It's an, it's an easy read. So I have a question for, for the co-chairs. Um, the, the notion of prioritizing public land for housing shows up on our many, many, many items list. Given that there's a place where it's already that discussion's already happening, is that something that we should facilitate more discussion around as the working group, or should we just acknowledge that there's a place where it's already happening and send people and ideas into that place? Because if there's a lot we got on our plate to unpack ourselves, maybe that's a topic where we can just acknowledge MTC already has an initiative and support that initiative. Is that, does that I, work? I think we can definitely talk about that. It'd be really interesting to see the recommendations and then also to see, uh, you know, to match that with the GCC work as well. Um, and, and also to bring in, and I'm not sure that you're aware that, that right now um, there is a lawsuit uh, with San Jose because they have indicated that charter cities do not need to abide by state surplus lands law. And some of the folks in this room are, are helping with that, uh, with that lawsuit. Um, but, um, but that's a concern because we don't necessarily have city support uh, for the laws that are on the books right now. Um, so looking at what ideas GCC might have or what MTC uh, might have, uh, as far as, as um, enforcement would be really helpful. I have a question uh, about the site example, uh, Scott Little Hale, one of the California Carpenters. So we're looking at a site with a walk score of 95. What were the factors that led uh, the example to have it be a three-story product with correspondingly fewer units per acre? Um, that was a handy uh, graphic that I had, quite frankly. Oh. <laughs> we, looked at, we looked at a number of different uh, prototypes for that. We, we, it's not necessarily the recommendation. So was something feasible at a, at a greater density than what was just depicted? Um, to the extent that we were looking at affordable and workforce housing, nothing is feasible per se. Um, so it's a matter of how much subsidy is required, right? Um, if you look at it at a, as a market rate uh, development, certainly there are uh, prototypes that would be feasible at that location. Um, but uh, our, our charge was to look at moderate to low to very low income housing, and uh, it's very typical that that would require a subsidy. But we did look at this site and many others um, at examples anywhere from townhomes in a place like uh, you know Upper uh, Sonoma County that might be a, a reasonable density in some places, um, all the way up to uh, high-rise construction with uh, podium or even underground parking. Um, so to keep you on schedule today, uh, why don't we try to wrap it up, and I recommend that each of you has some additional comments or questions or conversations that you 
try to do that now. And um, obviously, as you know, we have our next big day in January, both steering and uh, technical committee. So we obviously have some wood to chop between now and then. Uh, part of the process, I think, uh, I'll reflect my own views, was that we intended to put together a, a highly qualified and diverse technical committee and let the co-chairs of those committees, moderators, bubble up the idea. So it was, it was sort of a bottoms-up mentality. That may be wrong. Uh, that all the comments I heard about wanting more direction from co-chairs, because I think we intentionally tried to let the process work. Uh, we will give that consideration as to you know how that uh, should be done going forward, and, and try to give you some more direction when we think it's appropriate. Our intent was to have, as I said, uh, the intelligentsia in the room and the experience uh, guide this process. So we are all motivated to do it quickly uh, and effectively and efficiently. So we'll continue that. And uh, with that, we're adjourned.